How's everybody doing? Too much weekend, huh? Was it good, huh? Good. All right, well, we're going to, I guess, go ahead and get started. I have announcements, but I'll wait till after break to do those when uh, hopefully we'll have more people. All right. Um, it's what? Yeah, it's light. <laughs> All right. I wonder if I need to ring the bell again. All right. They look a little confused. You guys okay? Come on in. All right. Okay, Pastor Don, you ready? You're always ready. As he does have one button, and that's go. <laughs> Hey, everybody doing okay? Yes, sir. Cool. I'm a happy boy. <laughs> Had a good day yesterday, a lot of fun. We're going to do communion in a little bit. I'm going to actually teach on it first for quite a while, actually. Um, but uh, neat day yesterday. Had a lot of fun. Had the whole Tigger thing going on pretty good yesterday. We were stomping devils around here. It was a good time. <laughs> so, somebody told me the devil's a liar. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think. But it is a good day. It's a good morning. Excited about what Jesus is doing. Just glad to be one of his kids. I ended up baptizing about nine yesterday after service. I think we did nine. And uh, kind of some neat testimonies out of that. Um, the first couple to get baptized, uh, Dick Wazowski was praying with them. And uh, he asked him, he said, have you ever been baptized? And the man, the older man said, it was an older man. His name was Wilbur, and his wife's name was Teresa. And, uh, man, God is doing an amazing thing in their lives. It was just kind of fun to watch. And he, they were sharing their testimony with me. It was pretty cool. And just praying over them. And, man, the father's heart just in that guy. You could see it. It rose up. And we decided they were going to be Father Wilbur and Mother Teresa. I think, I think it's a good thing. <laughs> Amen. But just some really, really neat stuff that took place. A couple of kids got baptized, and one young boy got in the water. And I mean, he, I, I don't know, because I'm not good at the whole age thing. I'm going to say he was seven or eight. Uh, his name was Joel. And he, uh, I looked at him. I said, man, I said, where's your heart at? What do you, well, you know, why, why are you wanting to get baptized? And he, he looked at me as sincere as he could be. And he says, because I'm tired of living the old life, and I want to live a new life. <laughs> you go, boy, come here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it was pretty cool, man. But uh, good stuff happening. God's doing some neat things. It was really, really fun yesterday. Uh, big picnic here at the church yesterday, and we all went out, and a lot of us old men thought we were still young and decided to play ball. Decided today that was a bad choice yesterday. <laughs> went to get out of bed, and my body said no. My mind said, yeah, you have to. My body said, uh-uh, I ain't going. <laughs> you ever feel that? <laughs> yeah. That's the over 50 crowd going, yeah, okay, <laughs> amen, amen, but it's a good day. I'm excited about just being a, a son, and that's, that's what this is all about. It's about being the sons, man. He's, he's doing amazing things in us, and it's just fun for that. Um, Jeanette, where are you at? I know you're here somewhere. Come here. Share that testimony. Can you do that? It's just something I think is real important that we catch some of this stuff, um, one of the things that I would ask you to really, really consider, and, and we'll talk about this, is that we realize as, as we're, you, you, and I've said this, I said this last week, but you could spend 13 weeks, the, there's Mike here somewhere, because maybe Sue took it, but uh, you can spend 13 weeks in a class over and over and over, all kind of things going on, and never be changed. You can spend a lot of time, and, and yet when it comes down to it, nothing looks a whole lot different. And the goal and, of course, the objective of all of this is, is that we're continuing to renew our minds, that we're being transformed. Doesn't the Bible say being transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? Romans 12, 2. We're being transformed. Transformed has to be changed. You have to be, to be transformed, it requires change, and change has to be happening. But the change isn't an external thing, it's an internal thing, and it's the way I see things. It's my view, it's my perspective. I'm seeing things different than I used to see. That's my heart cry. That's the, the biggest goal of a pastor. 
pastor is to help people change their view, change the way they see things. So she was kind of sharing a little testimony with me. I thought it might just be effective for all of us just to kind of hear some of that. You okay with that? Yeah. Cool. You're up here now. You might as well. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Uh, God gets the glory for this one. Um, I was sharing with pastor. I have a daughter who's in college. And for two and a half years, I've just watched Satan take my kid, mm -hmm. just take her. And um, well, uh, well, he didn't take her. She just kind of walked. Yeah. Took his hand and walked away. And um, I just didn't know what, you know, I panicked like most parents, you know. So I'm binding. I'm battling Satan the way man taught me, the way books taught me. So anyway, like I was saying to Dan, sitting here, things are just falling off of me, mindset, the thinking. and um, So I just started praying like I saw this, these men do. And I started thanking God that I see my daughter the way he saw her. And I started thanking God that he, um, I love her the way he loves her. And I thanked him that he is drawing her back. And I thank you, God, that I love her the way he loves her. And I just stopped fighting with the enemy. And um, I just stopped seeing her the way the enemy was making me see her. And, and in eight, eight weeks, seven weeks, whatever it is that I've been in this class, when she would come home, I could love her. And I saw her the way God saw my daughter and not the way the enemy was making me see her. And my heart just changed towards my baby. I saw my baby like God saw my baby. So anyway, Saturday night, I got, um, well, anyway, and another thing that happened too was uh, Kim Santos, she's in our class. Her husband, I was sharing with her and with them and he actually got a song for Jenna, and he sent Jenna a song, and I mailed it to her, and that song ministered to Jenna that God gave. That's another thing that happened. Cool. And, mm -hmm. um, and so anyway, Saturday night, 1 o'clock in the morning, I get this call from my daughter, and she's crying, and she was supposed to graduate in May. She didn't. She's going to graduate in December, and she calls me at one o'clock in the morning and she's crying. She goes, Mommy, I want to come home. And I'm like, honey, you can come home anytime you want. This is your home. You come home whenever you want. And she's like, no, no, I want to come home. I got to come home. I don't belong here. It's not good that I'm here. I need to get away. I need to leave this place. It's not, I don't belong here anymore. And I'm like, Jenna, come anytime you, you know, this is your house. You, this is where you live. You can come home anytime. And she says, no, Mommy, if I, I need to leave school, I need, I need to, will you be, oh, she said, will you be ashamed of me if I don't graduate? And I'm like, I would never be ashamed of you. You know, the Lord's never, God is never ashamed of us. Would I, why would I be ashamed of you? Why would Daddy be ashamed of you? And um, so Sunday morning, here she comes with her little suitcase. And we just, and my, my husband's so great, because when he heard it, he's like, Take out the ring, bring home the, you know, get her coat. We're going to take our daughter out to school, uh, out to dinner. We're going to do the fat and calf. We're going to, our prodigals come home. And we're like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so we're just believing that she's going to come all the way home. Come on, man. Yeah, all the way home. I know what well, you mean. Well, I don't sure. care. I don't care if she graduates or not, you know. It's, that's the world. I, I think college colleges are bad anyway. Well, I think all schools are bad. <laughs> <laughs> Scratch that from the tape. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. It's okay. No, I it, it, the idea of the power of the testimony really deals more along the line of perspective. Do you understand how at one point the perspective was seeing everything that's wrong with my daughter and coming against it? The next perspective is loving my daughter and seeing her the way God sees her. Oh, it made it. And it's huge. And it's yeah, it was yeah. 7 weeks. It was really only it took me two weeks to get the language. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. it was hard. Right. Getting. <laughs> <laughs> how do you do that? <laughs> I didn't know how to do it. It's like. <laughs> 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 
I but don't know how it. to do. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's like how do I cool. do that? But it good. But it it's wonderful. And, and that's the power. Thanks. Thanks so much. I got you. Okay. It, the, the, the power behind that testimony is just changing our perception, changing the way we see things. And that has to be what's taking place everywhere that we're going. In, in, can I say this? In a whole bunch of situations. You know what I mean? I'm going to do this right now. Would you just bow your head with me for just a second? This is really in my heart. just rose up really, really strong. But if you have a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter and you want to see them coming back home into Christ, and, and you know what I mean? It's not about coming into the house, but it's really coming into the fold and, and, uh, and, and getting back in the kingdom and walking out their destiny in the way God would want them. But just to slip your hand up, we're going to pray all over this place. Father, right now, we just lift up before you right now our sons and our daughters. God, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, that prodigals are coming home right now. We call in the prodigals. God, I am convinced this is a season of revival of prodigal sons and prodigal daughters. God, I thank you for seeds that have been planted. We want to nurture and water them, God, because we're in faith. We're in constant faith, God, that those kids are coming in. And Father, by the, in the name of Jesus, we just lift them up right now and we say thank you, God, for your goodness. Thank you, God, for your grace. Thank you, God, these kids are coming in. Lord, even brothers and sisters, God, we're just lifting them up before you, and we're convinced, God, there's a conviction in our heart that says, Lord, they are coming in right now in Jesus' name, and God, I thank you for the Holy Spirit who woos them and entices them, because, Lord, right now in this season, God, I know that your Spirit is actively moving, and I'm believing, God, for, for the influence of heaven just to come upon them right now, a draw upon their hearts, a drawing, a wooing by the power of the Holy Ghost, and God, those seeds that were planted even years ago are going to bring forth fruit to life eternal. So, Father, we just lift them before you right now, and we thank you, God. We call in the prodigal sons. We call in the prodigal daughters, huh? and we claim them for the kingdom's sake in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen. 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 Bless God. I'm convinced God's up to something, and it's amazing. It's a fun time. Like this, I, I, I say it a lot, but we are in the most exciting time. I love this time. This is a great season. Amen. I'm excited about what he's doing. I'm, I'm trusting that you are as well. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 11. If we're going to talk about communion, we ought to look about what Paul said. Okay, it's a Monday morning. We're going to do communion. We're going to do it in a little while. Um, but I want to look at some things. Who's ever heard of Perry Stone? Perry Stone's a pretty good little preacher, I'll tell you. <laughs> I, I talk fast, but if you're going to follow Perry Stone, you got to, he, I think he can outrun me. I'm not sure. <laughs> so, like I sit there sometimes and I'll listen to him and I'll be like, whoa, slow down. And I think, I think I do that. Okay. <laughs> but, but there's a place and I just love the guy's got a depth to him. That's amazing. He wrote a book. It's called the meal that heals incredible book. A lot of what I'm going to talk to you today about is actually from that book. It's a pretty impressive book. I'm pretty excited uh, with some of the material that was in there. He actually wrote two of them. He's got an updated version. Uh, but I, I would tell you that it's, uh, it's pretty good stuff. If you'll follow with me from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I want to show you a couple of things that I think are really, really imperative. We're going to take a look through the meal that heals, okay? Verses 23 through 26 is where we're going to start. We're actually going on down through 30, but take a look at this. The Apostle Paul starts out and he says, for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he gave thanks, he broke it, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show the Lord's death till he come. That's pretty simple scripture, really. If we stop and think about it, just take it at face value. Every time we do communion, what's it for? It's to remember his suffering, to remember what he did. Not only remembering what he did, but why he did it. Come on, because he did it to bring us into the family. Don't ever miss that. I'll talk to you tomorrow probably about uh, the intimacy issues and, 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 and even the place where we're out of sonship. But I want you to see this. Every time that we take communion, it's with one intent and one purpose. He says, do it in remembrance of him. Let's remember what he did. That's what we're doing. We're remembering. It says, do this in remembrance. Every time you take communion, it's with that purpose. We're remembering what he did because that's what he tells us. Keep reading a little bit farther. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. That's a tough scripture right there. 
Can I tell you that when I first got saved, that scared me to death? Like every time they took communion, I was like, oh my gosh, should I take communion? You know, because maybe I thought, I thought I shouldn't have thought. Y'all been there? Anybody been there? Like it messed me up. Until one day, Brother Parton, who was the pastor again at the same time, because I, I would go to him all the time with questions. I, I, I used to think, this man is going to be so tired of me. But if I had a question, he seemed to be the guy that he was the go-to guy. I'm going to go to him. You know what I mean? So I went to him. I said, man, I don't even know about this whole communion thing. And, he, and I said, I, I, get, I get about half afraid because what? And he said to me, he said, Don, let me ask you a question. I said, what? He said, if you were to die right now, you going to heaven? I said, absolutely. He said, then shut up and take communion. <laughs> he said, if you're if you're worthy of walking with Jesus on streets of gold for eternity, I'll bet you're worthy of taking communion. Don't feel like that whole unworthily word there seemed to be a very challenging word to me. Is that challenging to some of you? It says, he that did, did eateth and drinketh unworthily. The fact of the matter is, if you know that your heart's in the right place, you know that if you were to die right now, you're going to be in heaven right now. I'll bet you're worthy. Make sense? Y'all sleeping today? Come on. <laughs> okay, okay, come on. But the idea is just that sometimes, and I think that that's one of them places where, where the devil tries to get on your ear and tell you, you ain't worthy, you better not take that communion. But I heard somebody say he's a liar. Anyway, <laughs> okay. So, so, so here's the deal, okay? When it comes down to it, you just, that, that's, we get a little weirded out over that, but the fact of the matter is you've got to know where your heart's at. And that's the big challenge for every one of us. There should never be a moment in your life where you don't know where your heart's engaged. You okay with that? Matter of fact, Paul's going to tell us that in just a minute. Let's read a little bit farther, okay? But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. I love the idea that he says examine yourself. He didn't say let a wife examine her husband. Didn't say let a husband examine his wife. Didn't say let a man examine the church. Didn't say let the church examine a man, Okay? I can remember as a young pastor, we did communion very different, uh, but we would serve communion out, you know what I mean, to everybody. And I'd have, I'd have church members come and saying, so-and-so's going to take communion. I wouldn't give it to them if I was you. I'm thinking, it ain't up to you. <laughs> it ain't even up to me. It said, let a man examine himself. But I had that, that's not once or twice, that was a bunch of different times. Where, where, and they meant well. How many understand? They meant well because they were afraid because they didn't understand some of the Scripture. We'll talk about this, okay? We're going to talk about a whole bunch of stuff here this morning that, that actually I think will really help us and promote some health in the body, okay? I want, to see, I want to show you this, okay? Let a man examine himself. You've got to examine your own self. You've got to know what's going on in your own heart. I, I can tell you that that's not just a communion. Can I tell you that that's all the time? You're in the, you're, you're, I'm going to go here. (laughs) You're just kind of walking things out. Somebody walks by and you're, and and, and immediately some, can I say some stupid thoughts get in your head, you know, and all of a sudden now you're projecting on them like they're less than, and you're not seeing them for their value or whatever it might be because the devil's just trying to plant seed in your head. And all of a sudden, and, and you know, do you get this right there? Like as soon as that happens. You got the whole big thump thing going on. You know what I'm talking about? And that's the Holy Spirit, and he's thumping your heart. You know why? Because he's trying to bring us back in line with the way God sees things. I'm telling you, it's always about perspective. It's always about, it's just about being able to see from God's eye view, okay? If we can maintain God's eye view, that's, that means everything. So when he says, let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup, that's a, that's a pretty strong thing, okay? Okay? For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. Watch this next phrase. Not discerning the Lord's body. Okay? Do you know what's really cool? The word discern means to distinguish clearly or perceive by the mind. That's Revel's Bible Dictionary. Okay? To distinguish clearly. He says if we eat and drink unworthily, we could, we, could actually, we could actually eat and drink damnation to our own self because we don't distinguish clearly what this is. And then he says, for this cause. Everybody see that? For this, what cause? Because we didn't discern clearly. You understand that? We didn't distinguish clearly. We didn't, we, we, we didn't, we didn't perceive by the mind what this was all about. He says, for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. What cause? Not discerning the Lord's body. Now, we got to understand something. He says, for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. That word sleep didn't mean rest well. <laughs> it meant the big sleep. How many know what I'm talking about? <laughs> okay. 
Yeah, yeah, you went to the grave in a sooner fashion than you should have. He said, many are dead. Why? Because they didn't understand what the Lord's body was all about. I'm going to talk to you about that because that's a big deal in the church today. We need to understand something about this. And again, it does affect our identity. It does affect a lot of stuff about us, okay? What I'm going to tell you is this. I'm going to tell you a couple of things this morning. Everything you need is provided for in that communion in front of you. Remember last week we talked about that being a common union? I'm going to tell you it's provided at the table. God's promises are right here. I hold in my hand the yes and the amen of God. That's an amazing thought to me right there. But, but, but I'm going to show you this through the scriptures, okay? The bread and juice represent the body and blood of the Lord. They bring salvation to the spirit, the soul, and the body. I want you to hear that. The spirit, the soul, and the body. We're going to talk about that because I think that's a big deal. See, 1 Thessalonians, it's probably chapter 5, verse 23. The apostle Paul says this, and he says it well. I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless to the coming of the Son of Man. Did we act that out here the other week? Yeah, last week we did. We talked about that. I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless. What's that mean? That your spirit and your soul and your body would be preserved blameless. That's an amazing verse to me, okay? And, and, and I see that. It's a preservation of the spirit. It's a preservation of the soul. It's a preservation of the body. How do we get that? How could we possibly comprehend that? I want you to go to Isaiah 53, okay? Because in Isaiah 53, we're going to find the picture of the suffering Savior, Okay? So I want you to go to that. I mean, that's what it's commonly referred to in theology schools and whatever. But I want to look at this, okay? Because I think Isaiah 53 is a pretty neat picture, and I want, to, I want to break it down. Okay, you there? Isaiah 53. I'm going to start in verse 1. He says, Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he'll grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. Hath no form nor comeliness... And when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. Do you understand what that just said? It's talking about Jesus. Um, you ever see the pictures? Of, do you have a picture in your head of what Jesus looked like? Come on, if some, say Jesus and you get this picture, right? What's he look like to you? He's got long flowing brown hair and, the, and those big blue eyes. That's Michelangelo's picture. I think most of the world has that picture of Jesus. I'm not sure because he was Jewish, at least on his mother's side. Think about that for a minute. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know. Maybe he had dark curly hair. Matter of fact, there's a couple of places. Isaiah even describes him with eyes that were black like a raven's. Did you know that? Yeah. That's kind of, that ain't in Michelangelo's picture. I, I wonder if one day we get to heaven, we won't be surprised with what he looks like. They tell the story that there were two guys. There was a white guy and a black guy. They were talking, and the white guy was saying, well, you know, Jesus is white. And the black guy says, I don't think so. I said, he said, I think he's black. He said, you think he's black? He said, he can't be black. He's got to be white. And they said, why? Why do you think that? They're both dead. They're waiting to meet Jesus. They're sitting in front of the gate, <laughs> and they're arguing about what he's going to look like, right? And he said, I think he's white. He said, no, I think he's black. He said, no, he can't be black because he's in the black. I said, well, why couldn't he be black? He said, because he said, I am that I am. He said, well, what do you mean? He said, if he's black, he'd have said, I is that I is. <laughs> so then, they, then they're arguing back and forth. Finally, finally, this, this bright light starts coming. This bright light starts coming toward the gate. And they said, here he comes. We're going to find out now. And as soon as the gate opened up, Jesus walked through. And he said, hola, mi amigos, que pasa? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Never mind. <laughs> Pastor Rick told me that. It was a lot funnier from him. Okay. Okay. But, yeah. Okay. But anyway. Yeah. We may be surprised when we see Jesus, what it will look like. I'm kind of excited about that. In the process, when I read verse 2, the attraction to Jesus wasn't a physical beauty. Do you all follow what I just said? That's what I get out of verse 2. The, the multitudes were attracted to him. They came to him from all over. But it wasn't, the attraction wasn't a physical beauty. They were attracted to what was in him. Does that make sense? That, that's got to be real, real important. Okay? Now watch the next couple of verses. He's despised and rejected of men. 
a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Everybody see that? I want to talk to you about a couple of things right here. One of the first things I want to talk to you about is this. He's faced rejection. Can I tell you something? I'm going to be real transparent with you. Everything that you've been through, he understands. He was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. I believe he's felt everything that you felt. I think on the day of his death, maybe the night before the betrayal that he faced from one of his closest friends stung worse than the nails in his hands. Who's ever been betrayed, you would understand that. You got to understand something. When it talks about being betrayed, a stranger doesn't have the ability to betray you, to betray you. An enemy doesn't have the ability to betray you. Only a friend can betray you. Amen. And the sting of betrayal is a painful sting, yet he understood that. Do you understand what I'm reading here? He's acquainted with our griefs. He understands. When you're going through it, trust me, he's been through it. He understands that. Um, sometimes, and I'll tell you a true story. I'm standing in a funeral home down in Redline with a man that was very, very close to. I had been with his son for about six months. Back and forth, his son was in the hospital. 31 years old, died of cancer. How I many you know there's a whole lot of pain? 31-year-old son died of cancer. There's a whole lot inside internally. And this guy just started coming to church when he knew his son was getting terminal. It had been coming, I guess, probably about, well, from now, from Thanksgiving to February. So maybe four months, three and a half months. But in the meantime, the dad and I had gotten pretty close, and I'd stuck real close to the dad, and uh, the son died. And, he, he, and the dad grabbed a hold of me. He said, when it comes time for the funeral home, you stay right beside me. You stay right beside me. Would you do that? Would you stay right beside me? Dad was a, was a building project manager. He'd been a fighter all of his life. He had, he had been arrested many times for brawling, and I'll just leave it at that. But he'd mellowed with years and was doing a lot better and had been coming to church and just a good guy and just a country boy, but a, a good old boy. You know what I mean? Just great heart. And uh, people would come by the funeral at the funeral home and shake hands and whatever, you know, how they do it to visitation. And he was standing beside me and a, 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 a guy comes by and he said, man, I, I, I know how you feel, brother. I know how you feel. You know what he immediately asked them? Did you lose a child? Well, no, I never lost a child. But I know how you're feeling. I know how you're feeling. And he would turn red in the face. And I'd actually have to hold him because he wanted to hit somebody. Because you don't know how I feel. If you haven't buried a son, you don't know how I feel. If you haven't lost a child, you don't understand what I'm going through. Don't tell me you understand. And he would get so frustrated. And I've watched that on him. And I'd calm him down and say, buddy, they mean well. Don't, don't take that the wrong way. They mean well. But the other side of that coin was as soon as there was a couple that came up about his age, maybe a little bit older, and, they, and the guy looked at him and said, man, I know what you're going through. And Don looked at him. The guy's name was Don. He looked at him, and he said, he said, you do? He said, yeah, I just buried my 28-year-old daughter from leukemia last year. Whole countenance changed because he understood. You know what he immediately said to the man? How would you get through it? What did you do, man? How did you? And immediately he's migrating to him. Why? Because he identifies with the situations. Make sense? He identifies with that situation. So now because he identifies with that situation, there's a place there of strength and grace, and, 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 and there's a camaraderie and a coming together. Can I tell you that everything you're going through, Jesus identifies with your situation? I'm going to tell you what I believe. In that temptation in the wilderness, remember that for 40 days, Remember that Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil? If you read Luke 4 or Matthew 4, they both tell you the same thing. When the temptations were, the, the, at the end of the temptations is when we read the three that we have. But prior to that, there was 40 days before that where he went through one temptation after another after another. Everything that you face, he's already faced. Everything that you feel. That's why it says he was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. He's already felt the sting of all that. He's felt the sting of betrayal. He's felt rejection. Come on, he was rejected. You've been rejected. It's terrible pain when people don't want to receive you, and all of a sudden you're going through that. He understands all that. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Does it say that? We need to understand what he's saying here. Strong stuff, okay? He, he's acquainted with grief. 
We hid our faces as it were from him. He was despised. We didn't even esteem him. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Now watch verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace is upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Everybody see that? There's three things there, and there's three things there for a reason. The first thing that's there is this. Remember that we talked about this. He suffers for the whole man, spirit, soul, and body. Wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. What's that mean? Transgressions are what? What's transgressions? Sins, right? Iniquities. Sins, shortcomings, failures. Come on. He was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. What's it saying? He was saying he took our, that, that, that sin upon him. He was, he was wounded for, that our spirit might be healed. The chastisement of our peace is upon him. Does it say that? What's that mean? Our soul. Your peace, your mind, your will, and your emotions. So come on. If he's wounded for my transgressions and bruised for my iniquities that my spirit might be healed, the chastisement of my peace is upon him. What's that mean? So my soul might be healed, and by his stripes, what? My body's healed. Do you understand? It's a healing for the whole man, spirit, soul, and body. We can't miss that. That's something that we have to grab a hold of and understand. Every time that we take communion, I think about those three things. I, every time I take communion, it's so my spirit might be healed, my soul might be healed, and my body might be healed. Every time I take communion, I understand that it's because of his broken body and his shed blood. It's right here. And so when I read this, I'm thinking, wow, this is healing for the whole man, spirit, soul, and body. That sunk into me a couple years ago, and I can't get away from that. Every time I take communion, that verse comes through my mind, that my spirit might be healed, that my soul might be healed, that my body might be healed. That's strong to me. Remember that I was reading this earlier? I think we can take communion every day and walk in supernatural health. I believe that. Remember that phrase, not discerning the Lord's body? not understanding his sufferings, not understanding why he suffered or the price that he paid. I read that, okay? When I read that, I think about this. I think, man, Jesus took that on for him. You're in an intensive care unit, and you're dying from a disease, and another man comes along, and he reaches in, and he, and he, and he just reaches down, takes your hand, and he says, brother, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to transfer your sickness from your body to my body. And you get up, and I'll lay down, and I'll take it. Wouldn't it be an amazing day? Can I tell you, 2,000 years ago, that amazing day took place. I, I don't know if you see it that way. I'm telling you, I can't miss that. I can't miss that. Do you understand? He took it. He took it upon it. Come on. Surely he hath borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. He took it. He took it on himself. He took that on himself, okay? That's just what Jesus did. That's amazing to me. So I think about that, man. Our emotional healing. A few months back, the Lord really spoke to my heart and said, there's an epidemic in the body of Christ, an epidemic of unforgiveness. There's an epidemic of unforgiveness, and, and honestly, I believe there's a lot of emotional pain, and the root cause is unforgiveness. We've got to let some stuff go, man. We're holding prisoners, and we don't even realize it, but we're the prisoner that's being held. That's a strong word right there. That's a real strong word right there. But I read this stuff, and it really speaks to me because the Lord spoke to my heart about this. There's an epidemic of unforgiveness, grief, rejection, bitterness, low self-esteem, oppression, depression. A, a lot of that, I think, stems out of the, out of the root of unforgiveness. And, and that speaks volumes to me. You, we, we find the church going from one healing line to another healing line, looking for a prophetic word to get them set free. You might get a word, but I'm going to tell you something. That word's going to be momentarily lived if you can't release the unforgiveness that's in your life. Like, I feel better now. Oh, I'm free. I'm free. But if you didn't, if you didn't forgive in that place, I'm going to tell you something. It's going to come back and slap you. That's just the best way I can say it. It's just going to happen like that. You know what I mean? Sometimes we just got to release the prisoners in our mind because the real prisoner is really us. Can I say this? Forgiveness for the Christian is not an option. It's not an option. It's a command. 
Come on. And we gotta, we got to get to that place where we're doing. Can I say this? I think it's a lot easier for me to forgive a brother or a sister than it is sometimes to forgive myself. I think sometimes the body of Christ, we, we, have, we don't have trouble with God forgiving me. I have trouble with me forgiving me. I don't know if that makes sense to everybody, but I'm telling you something. You messed up, and all of a sudden now you just want to beat yourself up for the next 37 years. How's that working for you? Because <laughs> I'm thinking that's not a real good idea. Man, there's a place where we just got to move forward and, and, and accept the grace of God. This for my brother or for me. We got to forgive one another. We got to forgive ourselves. There's a place where there's grace for that, and we walk through that. By his stripes, that physical healing is attained. That's strong to me. Whew. Do you understand that he became a curse for us to remove the curse from us? I think everybody in this room understands that phrase by now. That has to become a reality for us, every one of us. You know, it says in the, it, we were reading when supper was ended, right? He took bread, blessed it. What supper were they having? There was Passover. And we studied this the other day, but everything about Passover was pointing to Jesus over and over. Everything about the Passover was pointing to him. Anybody ever been to a cedar? That, that's amazing. I love that stuff. I, I, I love to sit with somebody that understands the Jewish culture and the Jewish heritage and, and really, oh my gosh, that's just amazing. That'd be a neat class. Maybe we ought to get Rabbi Ed to come down and do that one day. That'd be fun. He'd probably do that for me. Yeah. You want to do that? Yeah. Okay, come to the next school. I'll get him. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. I might talk to him. We'll see what God does with all that, okay? But I think that's amazing, okay? And here's the deal. When supper was ended, they're celebrating the Passover, okay? You, you might follow that out. I, I don't think we're even going to go there today. But in Exodus, it's Exodus 12, and you can study that on your own time. But everything about that pointed to Jesus, you know what I mean? And they, and they, they ate the lamb. There was a lamb for a house. We talked about all that kind of stuff. It, there's some amazing truth to all that. They eat the lamb, and they're ready to go. But I want to take you someplace a little different. Go with me to Psalm 105. And if you've never marked this, then you need to have this marked in your Bible, Psalm 105. It's an amazing chapter. But it's pretty cool stuff because actually David is now going to rehearse the history of Israel coming out of Egypt. David is rehearsing this, but it's amazing the truth that he has here. And I want to show you this because I think this is awesome stuff. We're going to jump down to about verse, I don't know, maybe 23 and start there. It says, Israel also came into Egypt, and Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. And he increased his people greatly, made them stronger than their enemies. Remember that? The Egyptians were nervous because Israel was growing and increasing. And, and remember, so, come on, then they started drowning the baby boys. You remember? They started killing the baby boys. That's why Moses was a basket case. Never mind. <laughs> okay. Okay. In the process of all that, right? You know the story. God's blessing his people. Israel's growing stronger than the Egyptians. Follow the next couple verses, okay? He turned their heart to hate his people, to deal subtly with his servants. That's the Egyptians, Egyptians' heart. He sent Moses his servant and Aaron, whom he had chosen. They showed his signs among them and wonders in the land of Ham, in the land of Egypt. Everybody okay with that? Remember the plagues. This is all the plagues. He's talking about the plagues right here. He sent darkness and made it dark. And they rebelled not against his word. He turned their waters into blood and slew their fish. Their land brought forth frogs in abundance in the chambers of their kings. Isn't that amazing? Do you ever read all this stuff? You ever go back and read some of the history? It is amazing stuff, right? There's a plague. Can you picture a plague of frogs like there's a million frogs just jumping everywhere? Come on, man. I mean, they're, they're opening their cupboard doors and ribbit, ribbit, and right in their face. Come on, they're everywhere. There's frog. Come on, you go, you go to pull the pan out of the thing, and there's a frog in the middle of it. You know what I mean? It's a, frogs are everywhere, all through the land. Could you ever get a? Because you got to get this. You got to see this stuff. It's visual. You know what I find amazing about that? The, one of the most amazing things I find about that is Moses comes to Pharaoh. Frogs are everywhere. And they, and they have this big conversation, and finally, the king, the Pharaoh is, 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 is submitting to Moses, and Moses says, okay, then when do you want me to get rid of all these frogs? You know what he said? Tomorrow. He said, tomorrow. We're going to spend one more night with the frogs. There's a title for a message right there. 
One more night with the frogs. What are you saying, Pastor? How many of us, come on, God dealt with us about something. Instead of moving on today, we well, you know, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. One more night with the frogs. I can't even imagine the mentality of, <laughs> when you want me to get rid of these frogs? Now! <laughs> it would be like immediately, but no. He was, wait, tomorrow we'll get rid of And that's what, read it. It's in the book. It's a great book. Don't wait for the movie. Here's the deal. The idea was, is that the frogs were everywhere. Why not get rid of them now? Honestly, I believe that God's saying to some of our people, what are you waiting for? Don't spend another night with the frogs. That's a little side note from where we're at. But boy, that really rises up in my heart. I just read that and it just really clipped in me. Don't, don't spend another night with the frogs. Watch what he says. He says, there's frogs in abundance in the chambers of the kings. He spake and there came diverse sorts of flies and lice in all their coasts. Come on, man. You getting a picture of any of this stuff? Do you ever, do you, I, it's one of the things that really gets to me, we have like 27,000 square feet in this building, and if there's one fly, he will find my nose. I, I get so frustrated with that. I'm like, get out of here. Okay. That's when you want that whole dominion thing really understood. <laughs> Die, fly. Okay. <laughs> okay. Here's the deal. Flies and lice in abundance. You get a picture of all that? Don't scratch your head now. Come on, stop that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right? And then he says some more stuff. He gave them hail for rain and flaming fire in their land. Got a picture of this? Unbelievable stuff, man. He smote their vines also in their fig trees and brake the trees of their coasts. He spake and the locusts came and caterpillars and that without number. You ever read any of this stuff? Come on, man. And then watch this. And did he eat up all their herbs in the land and devoured the fruit of their ground. He smote also their firstborn in the land and the chief of all their strength. This is amazing stuff, right? We talked about all this. Now watch. He brought them forth also with silver and gold, and there was not one feeble person among their tribes. Anybody read that? That's an amazing verse to me. You see what he just said? And when he brings Israel out, he brought them out with the silver and the gold. We're going to talk about some of that. But here's something that totally mesmerizes me. Two million Israelites. Do you understand there were two million Israelites? Do you all know there were two million Israelites? How many feeble? None. Not one feeble among them. We have trouble getting 27 together without a feeble, one or two. <laughs> they had two million. And does it say not one feeble among them? If you read that in the Hebrew, you know what it says? There wasn't any feeble there. <laughs> Isn't that amazing that that's exactly what it means? There was not, they had their strength. Two million Israelites came out of Egypt. Now, you've got to understand, that's everybody from babies to great grandpa. And there's not a feeble one among them. That's amazing to me. What happened on the night before they ate the lamb? Do you understand what I just said? On the night before they ate the lamb. I believe there was supernatural healing in all the land. I believe there was supernatural healing in all the land. And there was not one feeble among them. That speaks volumes to me. I, I read that a whole nation healed in one night. I think that's awesome. Not one feeble among them. They ate the lamb. I hope that that speaks to you the way that speaks to me. Because man, that speaks to me. Can I tell you something? This is my body broken for you. We eat the lamb. I believe there's healing in this thing. I'm going to talk to you about that. We're doing it in remembrance of him. What did he do? He paid an incredible price. What for? Wounded for my transgressions, bruised for my iniquities, chastisement of my peace upon him. By his stripes, healing's happening. Come on. They ate the lamb. Do you understand what I just said? Not discerning the Lord's body. What did Paul say? For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Why? Because they don't understand what's in the cup. They don't understand what's in the bread. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's something to that. I want your mind to think on that for just a few moments. We're going to study this a little farther. Go to John chapter 6. It's Jesus' most popular sermon. <laughs> it's not. People walked away by multitudes from John chapter 6. He says, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can have no part in me. Remember that? Yeah, they said, oh, this is a hard saying. Come on. 
But go to John 6. Let's see what he was saying because it's good stuff, okay? Let's catch it, okay? Look at John chapter 6. We'll go to 48. Go there, okay? Verse 48, I am the bread of life. Wow, that's like pretty amazing. I'm the bread of what? Come on. I'm the bread of life. What's that mean? What he's saying now is, he's saying there's life in this. I'm, I am the bread of life. Eat this bread. It's life. You understand that? Let me show you. Watch a couple of things. It's pretty strong. He says this, and I love this. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness. They're dead. This is the bread that's come down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I'm living bread, which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he'll live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can a man give us his flesh to eat? Then said Jesus, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. That's strong stuff. I don't know, man. Just read it for what it's worth. It's, are you reading it? Are you seeing that? I mean, it's right in front of you. Except you eat my flesh and drink my blood. What's he saying there? It's pretty strong stuff. For my flesh is meat indeed, my blood, I'm sorry, whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him up at the last day. My flesh is meat indeed, my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwells in me, and I in him. That's pretty, pretty, pretty strong stuff right there. It speaks volumes to me. It speaks tremendous volumes to me. When I stop and I think about this communion, we can't just, I'll say this, I'll talk to you real plain. For years as a pastor, we had a requirement that once a quarter we did communion with the church. How many of you were in that boat where you went through it because it was kind of a ritualistic thing? And you just did it. Okay, well, we're going to take communion today, yay, it's a good thing. But it never carried with it the weight of what this thing's really all about. I'm telling you, man, there's a lot to this. He says, he that eats my bread, and he that, he, he that eats, eats this bread and drinks this cup, he's saying, you got to, my flesh is meat indeed, my blood is drink indeed. What was he saying? Consume me. Consume me and be consumed of me. That, that's amazing to me. When I, when I take this in, man, this, this is serious stuff to me. It's not just, a, it's not just a, 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 a little cup and a, and a wafer. We have to stop and consider when we take this cup, when we, when we, when we drink the cup, when we eat the bread, man, there's, there's a powerful message behind all that. There's so much to it. It speaks volumes to us, and we, we have to look at this. Go over to Luke 22, and let me show you. I just think we've got to look through the book, man. Let's look through what, what's he saying. Because he's in the upper room in Luke 22, verse 17. I think this is awesome. Let's go back to 14. When the hour was come, he sat down. It was time. It was time. When the hour was come, he sat down. And I, I think this is kind of interesting. And the 12 apostles with him. At the table with him, there's a betrayer and a denier. But he holds no man accountable. At this point, he's going to share with them. He's poor. Can I say this? If you could consider the worst person you know, I mean the very worst person you've ever met. I mean like the baddest of the bad. Do you know Jesus died for them? He'd have shared with them that night. He was given his life for every one of us. The 12 apostles are with him, and in the process of that, I think that's pretty amazing. And he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I'll not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Oh, I think that's amazing. What did he just say? I want to eat the Passover with you, because why? Because the Passover is going to be fulfilled in the kingdom now. Isn't that amazing? Everything that the Passover was pointing to is about to be fulfilled. That's what he just said. 
The Passover was all pointing to his death, to his, to, to his suffering, to the price being paid, to the change of covenants, to the changing of testaments. You understand? And he said, it's all about to be fulfilled. I won't eat with you again until it's all fulfilled. Isn't that amazing? It's, we're on the edge of that. He's right there. Watch this. He took the cup and he gave thanks and he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I'll not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. I think that's interesting. I read this stuff, do you ever think about what it was like for Jesus to eat the Passover that night? He knows everything about the Passover points to him. He's eating the lamb. The bitter herbs, are you familiar with some of all that stuff, the egg that would have been there and all the different things that are with that? And they're partaking of that going through, they're going to sing the Hallel from Psalm what is it, Psalm 113? Does that sound right? I think it's Psalm 113. And, and, and there'll be a section of Psalm 119 that they'll sing. And it's all part of, a, of the Passover that would have went on. That was just natural for them to do. Everything about the Passover was pointing to Jesus. Everything was pointing to his sufferings. He is now moments away from what, what might be the most brutal beating of any man ever on the face of the planet. Do you understand that? And he's going to eat the Passover, and everything about that Passover points to him. He knows this. This is, a, this is a, like a really, really heavy moment. I, I don't even fully comprehend the idea that he's going to go to the garden and pray until a sweat becomes his blood. I know there's medical terminology for all that, but I, I don't even know how, how that's the heaviness of all that. I just know it happened. I just understand that, and I, and I think about that, and it really speaks volumes to me. But when I start to read this stuff, and I, I, I see this, they ate the lamb. They went through the Passover. He takes the cup. Take this, divide it among you. Then he takes bread, and he blesses it, and he breaks it. He broke the bread that symbolized his own body. That, that's a tearing that in half, tearing that in parts. It's an unleavened bread. It's not like a loaf of bread like Grandma made. It's, it's unleavened bread. He's going to break it. He's going to tear it, and he's going to say, here, eat this, all of you. Take this, all of you, and eat of it. This is my body broken for you. I, I don't know if we catch the weight of all that, but we need to catch the weight of all that. That's pretty serious. In the process of that, then he takes the cup and he said, this cup's like the New Testament in my blood. It's going to be, and I love this, my body given. He uses two terms here. He says, my body given and my blood shed. My body's given, not taken. My blood shed, not spilled. I think the terminology is pretty amazing as well. I stop and I think about all this stuff, and it really speaks volumes to my heart. I know this. Every time I take this, I'm showing his death till he comes. Every time I eat of this, it makes me think, wow, God, you're amazing. God, you're amazing that you would love me this much. That, that this cup and this, and this bread speaks that kind of volumes to every one of us. But I want to come back to that word. I want to come back to what we read right in the very beginning. And I want to think about what he said. He said, when we, for this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. Why? Because they don't discern the Lord's body. They don't understand What's in this cup? Can you think about two million Israelites and not one feeble among them? Does that mess with your head like it does mine? Because I can tell you something, man. I take this thing the way it says. It messes with my head. Two million people coming out of Egypt. They've been there for, for years. Now, I mean, those people haven't been there 400 years. I'm sure some have come and gone and died and whatever. But in the process of all that, it speaks volumes to me that they would come out of there and not one feeble among them. That means there was nobody limping. That means there was nobody, nobody on crutches. (laughs) 
Nobody had a little scooter. <laughs> Come on. Nobody on a stretcher. There wasn't one feeble among them. I, that messes with me. When I read that, it just jumped out to me like in volumes. Not one feeble among them. And I honestly believe that it was because on the night before, every one of them would have ate the lamb. And the blood would have been on the doorposts and above the doorway on the lintel. And every one of them walked out of Egypt. Did you catch that? With the silver and the gold. I love that. I love that they got the silver and the gold. They've been slaves for 400 years. They didn't get paid. Now payday came. Payday came. 430 years if you study it. 430 years. And now that's their day. And they, they got the silver. They got the gold. And they're walking out with something that's absolutely amazing. But the fact that they're all walking out just totally messes with my head. Not one feeble among them. I want you to consider that as we prepare our hearts for the communion this morning. Yeah. But he's on the way. I want you to think about this communion thing because it is a big deal. Go ahead. I just felt like Holy Ghost wanted to insert what you and I talked about, the lamb being tied outside the door. And uh, some, each, some of them even built a small pen for just such a thing. But going back the night before and, and, and killing that lamb, that lamb was put deliberately right at the door as they walked in and out of their, their place of residence. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was a custom, and still is actually, that they know that lamb, that, that it would become personal, that it would become intimate before they actually slayed it to put the, to do the, you know, when they sacrificed the lamb for the family itself, that they would intimately know that lamb before they would slay it. That's a pretty neat word. The lamb would be tied right outside the front door. Every time you come in and out of your house for about a week, that would be there and they would see the lamb. This is the lamb that's going to be slain. Man, there's a place where you and I just purpose our heart to be intimate with the Lamb and realize that He was slain for you and I. To me, it's a big deal. It's not a small deal. It's a big deal. As you look at the cup that's in front of you, and if you don't have one, we'll make sure that everybody gets one, but there's a, there's a place where we think about this, man. There's an incredible price that's paid. There's an incredible gift that's given in the cup and in the wafer, and we stop and we consider, man, He did this for me. He did this for me. And it comes back to that intimacy issue. I want you to consider as you hold that in your hand. It's the meal that heals. Isaiah 53, verse 5. He was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of my peace is upon him. And by his stripes, my healing's bought and paid for. I want you to take that wafer in your hand, if you would, just for a minute. As you consider that wafer, I want you to think about it. <laughs> I even sometimes, it, my mind spins in different directions, but I think about that. It's a perfect circle. There's probably something to that. The love of God's never ending. The love of God never ends. That even if I don't love him, he still loves me. While we were yet sinners, what? Christ died. He loves me that much. I want you to think about that for just a minute and realize Jesus said, take this. He gave the bread, gave bread to his disciples, said, take and eat of it. You know what I said first? He broke that bread. I never take communion that I don't break that because I think of his broken body, his body broken for me. I don't know what it was like 2,000 years ago in Palestine hanging on a cross. I've never been there. I can't identify with that. I can only imagine what it must be. But he paid a tremendous price for every one of us. I want you to break it and just hold it in your hand a minute. Father, even today as we break the bread in our hands, I thank you, God, for your love for us. Lord, I thank you that you would so love us that you would give your only begotten son to gain many sons and daughters. God, even as we consider the bread that's in our hands right now, I'm asking you, help us, Lord, to keep our hearts pure and our conscience clear, to keep our minds stayed upon you in every way, that we would understand, God, the price that you paid. It's an incredible price. 
It's an incredible price that you would pay that you would give yourself for us. Lord, you gave us your body. You said, do it in remembrance of you. This is my body broken. My body broken. God, help us to understand what that broken body looks like. Help us to understand what that broken body represents. God, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, that just as your body was broken on that cross and they tore your side wide open, the veil of the temple was rent in two. The veil of the temple that said man's on one side and God's on the other was torn in two because of your broken body. And it said now we have entrance. Now we can come into fellowship. Now we can understand. Now we can come in that face-to-face encounter like Adam had before the fall. We can walk with you. We can talk with you. We can understand things and mysteries that we didn't understand before because your body was broken for us. Lord, help us to never take it as a ritual. Help us to never take it as a light thing, but to always consider the price that you paid and what you've done. God, it's an amazing day as we have the opportunity to take of your broken body. Lord, we do it in remembrance of you. God, I thank you. God, I thank you. God, I thank you for the broken body of Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for giving yourself on that cross. You can take it need it. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for your broken body. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done. You've paid an incredible price. Wow. You gave your body to be broken there so that now your body here could be whole. That's amazing. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. He gave the cup to the disciples. And he said, see that cup that's in front of you? That cup represents my blood. I'm going to shed my blood for the entire world. That's what he was saying. I'm shedding my blood for the entire world. That speaks volumes to me. This cup is the New Testament in my blood. It's shed for you. It's shed for you. This cup... It's about a new covenant. It's a new testament. It's a new covenant. Because the old covenant couldn't get you to that relationship with God. This cup isn't about you getting to heaven. This cup is about you getting back to God. This cup isn't about you getting to heaven and getting your name in a book. It's about getting you back in relationship with God. It's about restoring us to the Father. That's what he was saying. When he said, I am the way, he didn't mean I'm the way to heaven. He meant I'm the way to the Father. I'm the way to God. Don't miss that. This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Paul says every time we drink it, we drink it in remembrance of him. You can take and drink. Thank you, God. 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 Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. If you're close to somebody right now, can you just take them by the hand for just a minute? I just really feel this in my heart. You don't need to reach across, and you don't need to jump anywhere. Just if you're close, and you can catch somebody. And if you're if you're not, it's okay. It, it doesn't hurt. It's all right. But there's something that's rising up in my heart about the body of Christ. God, I thank you for the body of Christ. You gave your body to be broken, that this body could be whole. You gave your body to the smiters. You gave your body to the whip. You gave your body to the, to, the, to the beatings. You gave your body to the cross. You gave your body to those nails. Even the spear that pierces your side, you gave your body for that, that we might be whole, that we might be restored, that we might be made new. I'm asking, Father, that you would just help us now to understand the fullness of the price you paid. Help us to understand the fullness of, of what you've done. Help us to understand the fullness of what was accomplished through Calvary. God, help us to understand the finished work of the cross because that's why we're here. That's what we're here for, God, is to understand our identity, what you purchased. If you purchased this for us, help us to understand what it is that's been purchased. It's the purchase price. Lord, I read that scripture and it convicts my heart. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. And it's because we didn't discern the price you paid and what you purchased. So God, help us to understand. We discern the Lord's body today. We discern, Lord, the blood. We discern, Lord, this body. Lord, we 
we come together and we say, God, we want to get this thing. We want to understand this thing. Help us, God. Permeate our minds. Help us to understand to the fullest the price that you paid. God, I thank you for revelation and illumination of the communion, that it never becomes a ritual, that it never becomes something we just do, that it never is just the Christian thing. And so we do it because, Lord, if we do it without understanding, we're no different than those that you spoke of in, the, in, the, in Corinthians. So, God, I'm asking, help us to have a discernment. Help us to have an understanding. Help us to be able to perceive by the mind and understand what the will of God is concerning these things. Father, we thank you for this privilege. We thank you for this opportunity. And we celebrate who you are and who we are in you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Yea, God. <laughs> I, re I really believe there's something to that. I really believe there's a place where, where we understand what this thing's really all about. Man, it speaks, it speaks volumes to me. Praise God. You doing okay? Everybody all right? I like taking communion with you guys. It's all right. Amen. You're like spiritual or something. Cool. <laughs> Yay, God. Did you? They're just, okay. Um, yeah, bring it on up. That's fine. Hang on just a minute, Linda. Yay, God. Go ahead. Um, I just want to ask a question. Okay. Um, uh, chapter 22 of Luke 17. Then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. Then he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. Right. I don't get that. I don't know what that means. Oh, he, what he's saying is I'm, I'm not going to have an opportunity to share with you guys again. Okay. It, in the King James it says, for I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine, this cup of wine, until the kingdom of God shall come. Okay, remember that he said repent. Why? Because the kingdom of God is what? At hand. Okay, uh, can, I, can I help you with this? And I kind of touched on this last week a little bit. But understand, at this point, we're still under the old covenant. The new covenant doesn't come till what? The shedding of blood. You can't have a New Testament until there's a death of the testator. Who's the testator? Jesus Christ. So until his death, we're still under the old covenant. Now the kingdom of God comes in with the new covenant. You okay with that? So that's what I was saying the other day. If you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, most of those gospels are under the Old Covenant. There's, they're really Old Testament books, all but the last chapter. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? You've got to keep that in your mind that way. So that's what he's saying when he says that, I, until the kingdom of God comes. Because the ushering into the kingdom comes when, the, when his death is there. New Covenant. Old Covenant, New Covenant. Can you think that way? You okay with that? Okay, cool. When, when he was walking with the disciples, we were still in the Old Testament until he was crucified? Absolutely. You okay with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jesus is born under the law, right? We got that from Galatians 4. Born, it says, I think that's an exact quote, born under the law, right? And he fulfills the law. He said, I didn't come to destroy it. I came to fulfill it. Why? Because he walked out the law perfectly. He's the only one that ever did. But he did it. What the, la what the first Adam failed, the second Adam brought in. You everybody okay with that? That's 1 Corinthians 15. That's some good stuff there too. Okay. Trisha, you had a question? Hang on. Just for the recording. Yeah. When he's crucified and it says that they gave him, they, they did the sponge and they gave it to him to drink. Right. Wasn't that like wine type of thing? I think it was vinegar, wasn't it? Okay, because it says wine vinegar, so I wasn't sure. I don't know, it doesn't sound good. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that was a question I had. Yeah, I don't think that's applicable to this situation here, though. I understand that's what you're saying. Okay. Okay. Um, here's the deal. He brings us to a point, and i got to say this. This is, like, really, really cool. Um, I don't watch a lot of TV preachers. I don't watch a lot of TV, period. But one of the things I, I can remember seeing this, um, T.D. Jakes, I, I, I like watching the Potter's House. Huh? That guy just preaches. He's just a preaching machine sometimes. But he's got some good stuff going on. And he, he gets pretty excited once in a while. I, I kind of identify with some of that. 
I've had people say, you're like a white T.D. Jakes. I think that's a good thing. I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> okay. But anyway, in the process of that, um, he was preaching one day, and I thought he said something that was absolutely amazing. He said, all these people coming around me and they're saying, life's not fair. Life's not, because that's how he preaches. Life's not fair. He said, I don't want fair. I want favor. Favor isn't fair. <laughs> I love that phrase. I've adopted that phrase into my life. I don't want fair. I want favor. You all right with favor? Yeah. Watch this. What Jesus does is through his death and resurrection brings us into a time of favor. You all right with that? I'm believing that favor shouldn't be fair. I don't want favor. I don't, I'm sorry. I don't want fair. I want favor. <laughs> I do want favor. Scratch that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Here's the deal. We want to live and walk in favor. Okay. But watch this. The year of Jubilee was called the year of favor. Do you remember what Jesus' first message was about? Anybody remember? Go to Luke chapter 4, man. Let's go. Go to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, okay? I love this. Go to about verse 16. This is fun stuff. I love this stuff, okay? Because we're going to get somewhere. I'm going to talk to you about a time of favor today because as, as we look at the communion, what was he ushering in? He was ushering in this New Testament, which is a time of favor. We're going to look at that, okay? So go to verse 16 of Luke chapter 4. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went to church. <laughs> okay. He, he went to the synagogue, okay, on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Now, to understand this, this is kind of cool stuff. Jesus doesn't pick what he's about to read. He doesn't even pick the idea that he's the one that's going to be doing the reading. But he goes and there's a, there'll be a chair in the synagogue and he actually sits in that chair on purpose. So that it will be his time to read. Y'all follow that? I don't know if you understand the custom of the day. But now he's going to sit there and they're going to deliver to him the reading for the day. Y'all follow that? It was a scroll. Now, they didn't have books like we have books. They had scrolls. Y'all right with that? Everybody understand when I say scroll? Have you seen some of the scrolls? Some of that stuff's pretty cool stuff. But watch this. Okay? So they delivered to him the scroll. That's what's going to happen. Okay? There was delivered on him the book of the prophet Isaiah. Everybody doesn't understand. If you've got a King James, it says Isaiah. So it's Isaiah. Okay? And when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel. How many know the name gospel there is? Good news. Okay? I'm going to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to captives, the recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised. Isn't that amazing? Like, that's all amazing stuff, right? But then read the next verse. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Does anybody have a Bible that says to preach the year of the Lord's favor? Yeah, a lot of you should have that, okay? That's pretty cool. The acceptable year of the Lord. It was referring to the year of Jubilee. It's the time of favor. What did he say? The very next thing that he says is absolutely amazing. Watch. He says he closed the book, gave it to the minister, and he sat down. And the eyes of them in the synagogue were fastened upon him. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Woohoo! <laughs> what did he say? He said, I've come to bring the acceptable year of the Lord. I've come to bring a jubilee to all the land. But it's not just a year. It's a dispensation. That's amazing to me. You got to understand when he said this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears, what he just said is he just declared himself to be the Messiah. I think that's amazing because he did it in his boyhood home. And they didn't take well to that, did they? Come on. But he's telling them, man, here's an opportunity. You guys are about to come into a, an incredible time of favor. So I want you to see this because I think it's amazing stuff. Watch this, okay? I love the idea. Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Oh. He's anointed me. I love that. Holy Spirit's anointed me. Isn't that cool? Jesus just said that. Do you understand that he's been with the Holy Spirit from time began? From, from before time began? I, I get so messed up with the whole idea that God has no beginning. It just really, it's, uh, ah. <laughs> and my finite mind can't wrap around that kind of stuff. But watch this. Now he's saying the Spirit of the Lord's upon me and he's anointed me. 
I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm anointed to preach the gospel. Anybody ever see this little phrase, I'm too anointed to be disappointed and too blessed to be stressed? <laughs> that's probably a good way to look at life too. But here's the idea. The anointing that's resting upon him is an absolutely incredible thing. And watch this. As he's walking out, isn't it, isn't it amazing? Did you, ever, did you ever, if you study the life of Christ, multitudes flock to him, and it's a love-hate relationship. You either, the, they either loved him or hated him. They either tried to get to him and touch him or tried to get to him and kill him. <laughs> it was like there wasn't no middle ground. Hmm. I want you to think about that for just a minute. Because he said, you're either for me or you're against me. You're either gathering to me or you're scattering from me. You're either with me or you're not with me. I was in Battle Creek, Michigan several years back. I was pastoring in Battle Creek, and there was a young girl there. And she was kind of struggling with some things, and she wanted to counsel a little bit. So the first thing I asked her, I said, let me ask you something. Are you saved? And she looked at me, and she said, kind of. <laughs> and that messed me up because I didn't know that. And I looked at her, and I said, honey, saved is like pregnant. You either are or you ain't. <laughs> I never met somebody that was kind of pregnant. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, you either are. You're, what's this kind of? The truth of the matter is, and Jesus says it really, really well, you're either for me or you're against me. You're either with me or you're not with me. That's what he's saying. I've often said this. I'm going to tell you something. This is the way I live my life. I'm a, I, I am an extremist. I, I go all out for whatever I'm doing, and here's the deal. If I backslide, you won't have to wonder. I figure if I'm going to serve him, I'm going to serve him 100%. If I'm not, I'm going to serve the devil 100%. Does that make sense? The idea of trying to live with one foot in the church, one foot in the world is absolutely ridiculous to me. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because i got news for you. It's going to split and you're going to hurt. <laughs> I promise you. <laughs> it's going to be painful. It's like sitting on a picket fence. You will not enjoy it. The idea is, and you stop and think about this for just a minute, Jesus just says something that's absolutely powerful. He said, he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to, to, to deliver captives. This is amazing stuff. And what he's saying is, I have come to change the world. Do you understand that? And then he says something that's absolutely phenomenal at the very end. He says to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. I don't even know if we can fully understand that or not, but what he's saying is this is a time of jubilee. This is a time where, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Here's a time of incredible favor. You have opportunity to live and walk in favor. The, the, the deal of it is, is if we were to study this out, what does favor look like? What's favor look like? If we're going to walk in favor, maybe we ought to know a little bit about what favor looks like. I want to do this, so, so grab the microphone, because I want to do something today. We're going to talk a little bit. I'm going to, we're going to get involved here. If I was to say favor, if I was to say, what does favor, what, does, uh, I'm, I'm a person that's not affiliated with church. You say, man, I've got the favor of God in my life. I'm like, what's that mean? What's favor mean? Answer that. Who wants to answer that? What's favor mean to you? Tell me what favor means. Donna wants to. Come on, we'll go all over the room. I'm going to ask a whole bunch of you because I want you to, I want to know what you think favor looks like. And I'm not going to tell you you're right or wrong because there is no right or wrong. I want to know your opinion. That's all. Cool. Now it feels better. Go ahead. Well, the word grace is his favor upon me that I'm his. <laughs> oh, there's a whole bunch. I'm his prized possession. He, his grace is in my life empowering me to do the right thing. Um, he, like, he chose me. He called me out to do good works. Okay. So that's his favor? Okay, okay. So favor, favor implies grace is what you're saying, right? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Bob. Go ahead. I would say for someone that doesn't know the Lord, when you're telling them that I have the favor of the Lord on me, I would think of a gift. A okay. gift. Just okay. An undeserved gift. An undeserved gift. Cool. Okay. Okay. Keep going. I have to stay with the students. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Anybody else? We've got all over the place, so just start running. Okay? Just looking at some different ideas of what favor looks like. I think um, I'm going to use it in a natural term for the fact that there are people that you are in their lives, and they grant you things, and it's their favor towards you because they love you, like you, and you have a special place in their life, and there's things that they wouldn't do for other people that they'll do for you. Okay. Okay? Because you have a special place in their heart. Okay? Go ahead. He makes his face to shine upon me. I'm his favorite. And I, I, I just Hebrews 4 comes to me real strong that 
I just rest in him. I trust him. And he loves me. And because he loves me, I can trust him. He just shows me his loving kindness is his favor. Okay. Okay. Right behind you. Um, I would see it as an undeserved continual blessing that can never be taken away. Okay. But, um, you, yeah. He just consistently loves, consistently pours. Um, and it's just a receiving of something that you didn't earn. I didn't earn. I couldn't pay. I couldn't pay for it. Cool. Good. Go ahead. Somebody else. Kathy's over here. Jeanette's over there. But let's just see. Because you're all hitting a bunch of neat stuff, actually. Catching all this? Different feelings about what favor looks like? Go ahead. Um, in my Bible, it says kindness to his people. But I think it's love. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. I understand that. Okay. She's running by. Okay. <laughs> I feel that um, when I have the Lord's favor, it's, be, it's able to walk into places and do things that I wouldn't be able to do without his favor. It's, he just opens up opportunities to me. Okay. To go where I couldn't go. It's like to see a king, to see a, a, a representative that... I just say, Lord, I need your favor to get into this office because in my, because I'm a nobody, but you are somebody, and I just pray, and he does it. Wow. Because I have his favor because I'm his kid. Okay, cool, cool. So there's a supernatural empowerment involved with that. Cool. Favor is being stress-free. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there's a good word right there. <laughs> Go oh, ahead, Shane. Yeah, when, when I think of favor, um, I kind of think of uh, uh, Joseph, where he, uh, um, his conditions, the world wouldn't look as favored. A lot of most of uh, his life's conditions, the condition mm -hmm. uh, around his life. But uh, again, going uh, to what she said about stress, it's our perspective on the, uh, we, being in God's favor means that we have a different perspective that does have uh, a divine backing to where we can be in the worst conditions. Okay. And yet still be able to, uh, and yet still have everything we touch turn to gold. And maybe not in the most uh, financial sense, even though I, I believe that's in there, you know, uh, mm -hmm. material wise, having our material blessings multiply and be given more responsibilities and grow in where we're at but also uh, ability to stand outside of the situation that we're actually in, like Joseph was able to, and still excel, no matter what we're going through, no matter what the world is trying to throw at us. Absolutely. Cool. Good word. Good word. Linda's right here. Okay, right behind you. Go ahead. That's fine. Go ahead. Okay. Um, going back to what Jeanette said, someone once gave the example of if you worked at, like, a McDonald's, you would know who the son was because he would do things that he wouldn't be able to that no one else would do. With, he'd do things without asking. He'd just go and do them and go and take things. It wouldn't be like, oh, I need to go ask the manager if the manager was his father. It's just kind of a given going back to he goes before us in things. Cool. Okay. Good words. A lot of good words. I was just going to say highly blessed. Highly blessed. Highly blessed. Blessed and highly just, favored. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right. I understand. Sure. Sure. Okay. Barb's over here. We, 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 you go wherever. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. I think of it as a special advantage, as though, like, things in the natural line up for you rather than against you. Wow. Divine protection, um, an outpouring, and also provision. Wow. Okay. A lot of good words there. A lot of good words there. I'm just going to let you keep running because there's a lot of hands going now. Because we've got a lot of ideas of what favor looks like, right? Go ahead. I think um, of him unconditionally loving me as his child. There's no... There's Talking no, to Mike, honey. Yeah. There's, there's no bars bared. I'm unconditionally loved. I'm his child. And I'm loved far beyond any, anything anyone else could ever love me. Okay. Unconditionally. Unconditionally. Absolutely. Okay. Lots of different ideas. Shana's behind you. Um, the word that comes to mind for me, if I were to try and describe it to someone, um, 
would be providence. It's being able to walk without thinking, be able to do. I do it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Go you ahead. know, just just going about your day in rest without mm -hmm. having to be in here and just mm -hmm. being, mm -hmm. and and resting in that and anything that you want, not having to be here, but just having it because gotcha. you are. Okay. Cool. You understand what she's saying? It's just a natural response then. Yeah. I went to um, Lancaster Prison one time, and I had to explain to, to these women who were in prison about what love and grace and favor was. And the Lord kind of gave me this analogy. It's like, remember when you were a kid and you played, like, kickball or baseball, and if the ball didn't go the right way, you would immediately call, do over. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because I had to explain to them in real simple terms what the favor and the grace and the love of God was, and they really understood it when I said that. And that's what I think. The favor of God is that if we don't do it right, we can say, Lord, I need a do-over. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I can see that amplifying our prayer life right now. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, go ahead. Um, when, uh, at the beginning, when some of the responses were, favor is grace okay and that was my response and i've been taught that grace is god's riches at christ's expense mm -hmm. and i think that does favor for me okay a lot of neat terms a lot of neat ideas a lot of neat thoughts okay here's the idea favor is a derivative from the word favor it isn't it kind of nice to look at yourself as God's favorite? Because I've been saying for years, Jesus loves you, but I'm his favorite. I'm convinced of that. Now watch this, because some of the things that we're going to look at, okay, I, I think this, if you look at the scripture that's on the wall in the church, it's Matthew 6 and 33, and a lot of you might know that, but it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these things will be added unto you right? And if we, we'd have to understand what all these things are, we'd have to read the chapter, but he's talking about provision. He's talking about, you know, everything that you're absolutely going to need, all the necessities of life. It's food, it's shelter, it's clothing. He touches all that stuff for the necessities of life. And he says, if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, his righteousness, and I preached a couple weeks ago here on a Sunday morning about preaching on, you know, about going after his righteousness. But in the process of that, what we found was if we were to seek the kingdom of God, seek his righteousness, everything else falls in line in our life, and we find the favor of God. Why do you say that? Because I believe, and, and it's probably where I'm at, but kingdom living releases favor. We're going to talk about what that looks like right after the break, because Sue's standing up there saying, but before we take a break, there's a young lady that's coming, and she wants to say something, and I bet I know what it's about. Well, that would kind of be good. How many of you know, if you were here yesterday, what today is for me? A little louder. Christmas in July. Yes, and if you're watching by internet, it's okay. I'm just a little goofy. It's all right. Today is Christmas in July. So as you leave, there's a little gift for you by the door. Some is for the ladies and some is for the men. So be blessed, and we love you here. Take your break. Oh, wow. Christmas presents. Cool. Okay, here's the deal. Take a break. We'll be back in 20 minutes. Wow, sounds like a good school. Steve Swanson's just fun. So is Jamie. Yeah, good guys. Listen, good stuff happening. Everybody doing all right then, right? Cool. Did you get your Christmas presents? Cool. I had nothing to do with it. That's all, Lori. <laughs> okay. She, yeah, she's pretty amazing. It's too late. The tree's been removed. No, no, it's, it's, they're, they're all, it's over there. There's uh, she, so things for the women, things for the men, so take a woman's one. Okay. <laughs> Bless God. Everybody's good? Listen, we're talking about favor, and favor is like this amazing word, because we all want to walk in favor. I mean, I've never met anybody that says, well, here's my problem. I have too much favor in my life. Yeah. I wish I didn't have all this favor. It's killing me. See, nobody ever talks that way because favor is something we all want, okay? Favor is an, an amazing thing. So, so we think about this, okay? And I think to me, I really believe 
Kingdom living releases favor. And I'm going to talk to you about that because that's a strong word to me. Um, as, and you've got to understand, God's not a man. So, so in paralleling God with what man's characteristics, sometimes that can be a little challenging. But just follow this train of thought. If you would want favor, I'm just going to say Pastor Lori was just there. If you want favor with Pastor Lori, I happen to live in the realm where I like to have favor with Pastor Lori. <laughs> Let's just pray about that. Okay. <laughs> Uh, what do they call that? Varying degrees of success. Uh, <laughs> but, but in that, uh, I know that there's certain things that I do with her or certain things that she likes to, me to accompany. Uh, can I say this? I hate grocery shopping. This seems to me to like this terrible waste of time. And, and I don't know. It's just something about it. We all have our little things. It's just I don't like to go grocery shopping. Guess what my, life, my wife likes me to do with her? She wants me to go grocery shopping. She just thinks it's a great time and we can spend time together walking up and down the aisles. I don't know if it's a man thing, woman thing. You know, men are on a mission. Man goes into Kmart. What's he do? He needs a shirt. What's he do? He goes to the shirts. He picks out that one. He grabs it and walks to the register and leaves. It takes a man about seven minutes to buy a shirt. A woman wants a shirt. Come on. We got to go to Kmart, Walmart. We got to go to Target. We got to go to Kohl's. We got to go to Boscov's. Then we go to Bonton, and then we go back to Kmart where we saw the shirt in the first place. <laughs> and it's two hours and forty nine minutes. Because <laughs> we all, yeah, 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 we live different. You know what I mean? Anyway, in the process of that, there are certain things that you just do. You just do because you know that that's going to give you a. a can I use the word points and you all understand what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> favor. <laughs> it's exactly what it is. It's the same. It's favor. You know what I mean? And that's where we're at. I want you to go to Psalms 102 because we're going to look at this. I want to talk to you about favor. Okay? Because I think we need to understand favor. But favor with God is probably different than what we might think. So let's go to Psalms 102. Everybody there? We're looking at verses 12 and 13. Pretty simple verse. But thou, O Lord, shall endure forever, and thy remembrance unto all generations. Thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion. For the time to favor her, yea, the set time is come. I, I, I kind of like that phrase, the set time. I like the thought of a set time of favor. We hear a lot about favor. We talk about walking in favor. When I think about favor, I think about this, God inserting his influence in my life. God inserts his influence in my life. Some of you said a whole bunch of neat things. You said it's like, I, I couldn't do this thing, but then God helps me. He inserts his influence in my life. I got to see somebody that I couldn't have seen. I went into, went into the Capitol to see somebody that nobody else could see, but all of a sudden they said, yeah, you can come in. Sounds like favor. Do you all understand what I just said? <laughs> Situation seemed kind of strange. Watch this. You put an offer on a house because you're going to buy that. You want to buy a house. And I'm just going to pick some random numbers, but watch this. They wanted $150,000 for the house. Other people had even offered one hundred and thirty-five or one hundred and forty, dollars and they, they, it was turned down. Then you came along, but you could only do one hundred and twenty. dollars but you offered one hundred and twenty, dollars and all of a sudden, for some reason, mm -hmm. yep. they just decided, okay. Yep. I think that's favor. I think God just spoke to their hearts and searched his influence, and there's favor there. Y'all follow what I'm saying? Like, I think favor's a big deal. I really do. I think favor's a big deal. But there's a place where we walk in favor. But I got to tell you something. In order to walk in the favor of God, there's some conditions that have to be in our life. I want God's favor. But so does everybody else on the planet. <laughs> Come on. Oh, I'm going to talk to you today. Okay? I want favor. How do I get favor? You know, one of the things I think is real important, there's a, there's a word just kind of rises up in my heart. If you want favor, why not ask for it? Yep. <laughs> I, I think it's okay to ask God for favor. God, I need your favor in my life. Why do you say ask for it? Because James said, you have not. Yes. Yeah, you know that. It's amazing just the thoughts that can come to us. But the idea is, is this, is that we know what the scripture says, let's do it. You have not because you ask not. Sometimes I think it's okay just to ask for favor. Sometimes we ought to just say, God, I really need your favor in my life. 
I wake up in the morning, I expect, can I say this? I expect to walk in favor. I just really do. I wake up with the expectancy that <laughs> I'm his favorite. Why wouldn't I walk in favor? I, I think there's a place where, can I say this? If I'm expecting it, then what else? I, I'm going to, I want to be aware of it. I want to acknowledge it. I, I want to thank him when I see it in my life. It's appreciated. I think those are important things. Okay, so watch this, because I'm going to talk to you about a couple of things. And, I, and I, th I think about this. See, I think a person can have, oh, let's go to Luke 2. Go to Luke chapter 2 for just a minute, because this is really in my head right now. We'll come back to Psalms in just a minute, but I'm going to go to Luke chapter 2. I, I think we all need favor. So watch this, because this is a pretty interesting word. Let's go to verse 52. Luke 2 is what? The birth of Christ, right? But 52, he's growing up. Watch this. In verse 52, it says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Everybody see that? Did you see that Jesus increased in favor with God? That's an interesting word. He increased. You mean he had favor and then he got more? That's what increase means. I'm just helping you now. This is what's called teaching. Okay. <laughs> okay. But watch this. He had favor with God, and now he's increasing in favor with God. Was there ever a time when he wasn't in favor with God? He was always in favor with God. But this verse tells me there's a place where he increased in favor with God. I find that an amazing verse right there. Like, I never thought much about Jesus increasing in favor. Jesus had the favor of God. But he increased in favor. Does it say increased in your book? Yeah. Anybody got anything else in there? Blessed. Yeah. He was blessed with favor? Blessed. Oh, okay. He increased in favor. That's amazing to me that he increased in favor. Now, what I get out of this is this. I think it's pretty strong. There's two kinds of favor from what I just read here. There's favor with God, and there's favor with man. I think that's interesting. Because I believe a person can have favor with man and not have favor with God. But I don't think it's possible to have favor with God and it not fall upon man. Do you understand what I just said? So there's a place. I want favor, and this is an interesting thing. I don't want fair. I want favor. Why? Because favor isn't fair. Fair is for the other people. <laughs> but I, I want favor. So I want you to see a couple of things here because we're going to talk about this because I believe that God will insert his holy influence into our life if we, if, we, if we leave space for that. I think if Jesus increased in favor, we ought to want to too. Okay? Now watch this. I'll increase in favor when I understand my identity. Why? Because, and I can't remember, it might have been Kim back there that said, if, the, if, I, if, if my dad owns the restaurant, I don't have to go around asking for everything. There's some things I'm just going to be able to do. Why? Because it's my inheritance. That's a good word, inheritance. Y'all follow what I just said? A um, bunch of kids were running around in the church. We were still in the old building, and the old building was laid out a little different, but the center court, and right off the center court, you came into the main office, and then off of that office was my office, if that makes sense. Because you had to go through the main office to get to my office, okay? And, and what happened was a bunch of kids were running around in the center court, and I, didn't, I don't think they knew I was here, but I was in my office. And they got carrying on. They were, I don't know what all they were doing, but they ended up all running into the office, which they weren't allowed in, and they knew they weren't allowed in. And I heard them in there, so I thought, oh, this will be fun. So I, I got up, and I just grabbed the doorknob and rattled the door. And they said, Pastor's in there, and they all went running, <laughs> except for one. Keegan, my grandson, was there, and he turned and said, you don't have to run. It's just pap. <laughs> Do y'all follow that mentality? Yeah. Why wasn't he worried? Because he's in a place where he understood he has favor. That's my pap. Do you understand? Because Keegan's got my heart in a major way, and he knows that. In that same essence, is there a place where we understand our identity is strong enough that we understand we're favored everywhere that we go? I expect favor. I really do. And, and I know, watch this. 
you pull into a large parking lot and you get a good parking space and you can say, wow, God's given me favor. And I, I, believe, I believe God can give you favor in a parking spot. I don't want to use up all my favor in a parking spot, but a little bit doesn't hurt, <laughs> okay? And, and there's other things like that that over and over we could just find. You walked into the store to get something. I can tell you something. I, 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 there was, I needed a tool the other day. Uh, we got a shade thing for the, for the back porch and I won't get into all that. But I thought, oh, man, I, I need to just run in. I'm going to get a... And so I ran into Lowe's. And, and when I ran into Lowe's, I t made a right corner and right... I mean, so I went in, turned right, and right on the right-hand side, there's this big shelf, and they got everything there on half price. And guess what was there? Just what I needed. I said, Jesus, you doesn't love me. <laughs> See? See? And, and, and you might think, well, that's just coincidence, but I'm not good at coincidence. I'm pretty good at providence. And my idea is this, is that I thank God in search influence. There's favor with God. There's favor with men. There's just favor. God just gives his people favor. See, I was on my way to Sears. I got to tell you this. This is kind of cool. I was on my way to Sears because I'm like craftsman tools. And I thought, no, you know what? I can just grab it at Lowe's. It'll be easy to get in, get out, back and forth. You know what I mean? So I ran into, I think that's Holy Ghost. I think God will do that. Because he knew it was on sale when I didn't. Does that, does that make sense? I hope that makes sense to you. I don't need to talk to you about that. I think there's really a place where we just got to get a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit in those kind of areas. Now, I got to tell you something. Going to Lowe's, I didn't even realize was God. I just thought it was a good idea. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense to anybody else. But afterward, I could look back at it and see, God, you had your fingerprints on that, and I didn't even realize it. Does that make sense to anybody? You know, I was living that. Because I'm going to tell you something. There's a place we walk in that. And we just, there's a sensitivity to just walking out the kingdom and allowing God to give direction to our everyday life. I believe that I've, I, 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 love, I love when God sets up appointments. Do you understand what I just said? Like, watch this. And this, was, this didn't happen this way, but just watch this. Imagine going into Lowe's, and then all of a sudden, there's a guy standing there, and you get into a conversation, and you just know this guy is somebody that God wanted you to meet with. I can't believe how many times that happens where you turn around, you're just sitting, maybe you're sitting in a restaurant, maybe whatever it might be, and all of a sudden God just has divine appointments, and it's because we were sensitive enough to allow God to direct our footsteps. Because I'm convinced the footsteps of the righteous are still ordered by the Lord. I believe God orders our steps. And when we're, Bobby Joe and I were talking at the break, and there's a whole bunch of stuff. Can I say this? In my own head, there's like a whole bunch of stuff that got there, and it got there really fast, but it's a slow leak to get down here. <laughs> I don't know if everybody gets that. Do you all get that? Like it's all here, but it's, it's taking a lot longer. It got here a lot faster than it's getting here. Does that make sense? I, I bet that's working for you guys, <laughs> okay? You know what I mean? But, but the truth of the matter is it's still dripping. Come on, it's still dripping. It's still coming. And, you know, we were carrying, um, who was with me? I can't even remember. Yesterday, uh, we had, I don't know, it was probably the biggest ice chest on the planet Earth. <laughs> and it was full of bottles of water and ice. And I can't remember who was carrying. Somebody had the other end of it with me. Anyway, I grabbed the end. And we had a, it has that little plug. You can let the water out. You know what I'm talking about? And I pulled the plug on it, and it was just trickling, just trickling out, just a little bit at a time. And we were walking, and as we were walking, it was still trickling out. It was getting all, and it was ice water. I mean, it was really cold. And I don't know if you know how hot it was, but I had sandals on. It was running on my feet, and it felt good. I had a feet washing service on the way down to the ballpark, you know what I mean? Because so, it was just running. But, but here's the deal. All of a sudden, that little trickle turned into a gusher. And I realized what happened. There had been an ice cube there that came through. And once it came through, there was no blockage, and it was rolling. I'm praying that God will melt the ice cube here, and it'll roll. <laughs> okay. I don't know if that made sense to everybody, but that analogy works with me. Because there are certain things that just trigger, and all of a sudden, did you ever get, because then all the dots start connecting, and the lights are coming on. It's like the most amazing feeling on the planet. It's just fun. I start reading some of this stuff, and it really speaks to me, and I, I think this. If Jesus increased in favor with God, that kind of messes with me because I would have thought favor was always, but it says he increased, there was more. That's amazing to me because, see, I believe this. I believe you got favor in your life already. I know that you got favor on the day you got born again. The favor of God was upon your life, but there's a place where we increase in favor. I want to increase in that. That's a big deal to me, okay? So that's kind of cool, okay? 
I want you to go back to Psalms a minute, but let's go to Psalms 5. We'll go to Psalms chapter 5. I want to look at a couple of things concerning this. I'm, I'm really trying to just lay a foundation for where I want to get to, okay? But go with me to Psalms 5 which is right after Job, <laughs> okay? Psalms 5, and look at this for just a minute, okay? Look at verse 11. But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy, because you defend them. Let them also that love your name be joyful in thee, for thou, Lord, will bless the righteous, watch this, with favor that will compass him as with a shield. I love that. He said there's rejoicing, there's shouts for joy. Uh, th this kind of stuff speaks to me, okay? It even says God defends them. Why? Favor. Favor. God will defend you with favor. I, I think that's an amazing phrase right there. God wants to defend you with favor. I, I hope that that speaks to your heart. There's a place where there's joy, where there's rejoicing, where, 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 where you see God... Do you understand when I say God defends you what that really looks like? Let me tell you something. Um, I'm going to give you a phrase that, that's something to live by. Do the right thing. Always do the right thing. Do the right thing simply because it's the right thing to do. No matter what anybody else does around you, you do the right thing. You do the right thing. Always do the right thing. And you won't have to defend yourself. God will defend you. I, I live by a phrase. I've preached this for quite a few years, but watch this. I absolutely and adamantly refuse to allow the way you treat me to determine how I'm going to treat you. Everybody understand what I just said? I absolutely and adamantly refuse to, to allow the way you treat me to determine how I'm going to treat you. That's a good phrase right there. I'm never going to let the way you treat me to determine how I'm going to treat you. I'm called to become love. I only have one way to treat you. I've got to love you. That's never going to change. It doesn't matter who it is or how they're acting or what they're doing. You're called to love. Is that okay? You follow what I'm saying? Because sometimes what we've allowed to do, watch this, is the way somebody treated us, well, then we reciprocated in kind, and all of a sudden we're treating them the way they're treating us, then we become no better than they are, and then we want God to step into our defense. Why would God step in and defend us for treating them the way they're treating us? Does it make sense? But if I walk in love and I continue to do this thing the way I'm supposed to do it, and I walk this out in sincerity and truth, you know what? Now I've got a promise that God said he'll defend me. And with favor, he'll compass me with a, as with a shield. Like he's, I've got this giant shield of favor around me. That's a pretty good day. I want you to picture walking out your life like this. I've got a shield of favor around me. Can you imagine having a shield of favor? God's favor everywhere you go. What's that favor? God inserting his holy influence in your life. Isn't that amazing? What a great thought that is. We went up to Keystone Diner the other day. I'll, I'll give you this. It's kind of neat. The owner there, her name's Sophie. She's up there. Uh, she knows me pretty well by now. <laughs> She decided that, uh, I was sitting there with somebody else, she decided she had just made this cake and she wanted to know how good it was. Guess who she picked to determine? Because somebody has to check. <laughs> she says, uh, and she's Greek, and I bring this to you. I want you to try it. You tell me how you like. You tell me how you like. <laughs> so now when I go in, I say, what, what kind of cake are we baking today? <laughs> she just free. Now watch this. Restaurants pack solid. Why did she come to our table? Do you understand what I'm saying? I just believe there's a place where God inserts influence and there's favor with man. Do you understand what I'm saying? I pick that stuff. That's just one crazy thing. And I don't want to use up all my favor on cake because there's pie. Okay, okay, okay. But, but in the same message, watch it. There's a thousand things to think about with this. And I want you just to go with this for just a minute. There's a place where, where you just walk out. The blessing of God on your life, the favor of God on your life, the grace of God on your life. You guys used a ton of different words to describe favor. They're all good. But the truth of the matter is, is that for me to walk in favor, one of the first things I've got to do is I've got to acknowledge that I'm a favored son. You okay with that? And then when favor comes, we acknowledge that favor. I, I, I think there's something to that. When God shows favor in your life, just acknowledge it. We'll experience more of it as we become more aware that we're experiencing it. 
And we acknowledge it over and over. I, I'm, I'm learning this stuff, man. Watch this. Go to Esther. We've got to look at Esther. So let's go to Esther. Because how, how can you teach on favor and not go to Esther, right? Okay, let's go to Esther, chapter 2. Look at verses 15 through 17. Because that's major stuff. Now we'll find out where the Bible scholars are. Okay. <laughs> Esther, we're going to chapter 2. Okay, you there? Yeah. Esther's really, really amazing. How many understand the life of Esther? Do you know Esther's the only book that doesn't have the name God in it? God's name never, it never says God. It's the only book in the Bible that doesn't say God. It's kind of interesting. A little trivia, no extra charge. Okay, <laughs> okay watch this. Now, when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go in unto the king, she required nothing but what Haggai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her. I want to stop with that thought for just a minute. We're going to read a couple more verses, but I want to talk to you. How many know the story of Esther? The Jews are under oppression. There's some things that are going on, okay? But here's the deal. There's a be- the Vashti, the queen, has, uh, has defied the king. And, and, and probably in our standards today, we would understand why. But in that time frame, this was a bad taboo thing. And now she's exiled from the kingdom. And, and so what happens is she's exiled. And now we've got to replace her. So Esther... Is part, can I say this? It's part of a beauty pageant. They're trying to pick Miss America, only there wasn't no America yet. Okay? But she's part of that. Now, she's a Jew, but she's a secret Jew. You all understand that? She's a secret Jew. She's a closet Jew. Okay? And there's a reason for that. But I want you to see something, because we've talked about Mordecai, and some of you that are Bible scholars, you know Mordecai. What was actually his relationship to Esther? Who knows? Well, let's read it. Okay? When the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihel, so Abihel's her dad, and Abihel is the uncle of Mordecai, then Esther would be a be a cousin. Because I've heard uncle I've heard Uncle Mordecai preach for a long time, but I don't think he was an uncle. I think I think Abihel was the uncle of Mordecai, so Mordecai would be the cousin of Je- of, of Esther. Okay. What's that? Yeah, first cousins, okay? Watch this. She required nothing but what the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women appointed. Esther obtains favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her. That's amazing to me. So Esther is taken to king, that guy, <laughs> Ahasu, <laughs> King Fred, okay? <laughs> okay. I, I, and I want you to see this because what happens is she's going to now come before the king. And I want you to see. So Esther was taken under the king into his house royal in the 10th month, which is in the month of Tabath, the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther above all the women. And she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Everybody see that? That's pretty amazing to me. Right? What happened? Okay? God inserts his influence on her life. Everybody see it? Did God want her in that position? Absolutely. God wanted her in that position. Now, what I want to talk to you about, what I'm going to challenge you with is some thoughts. I'll give you some thoughts to think about. Okay? Here's the deal. God's influence is on her life, and now she's in a position. Watch this. Is she qualified? What qualifies you to be the queen? You've got to be pretty. I guess she's qualified. She was beautiful, right? But in the essence of all that, there's some things that are going to happen and transpire where God wants to set her there. Who remembers the phrase? Probably anybody that's ever read the book of Esther, what's the one phrase we remember? Perhaps you've come into the kingdom for such a time as this, right? God has his hand upon this. His influence is upon her life. He has set her into a position to do something for the kingdom's sake. She's going to save all the Jews. The Feast of Purim is all about Esther. It's an amazing day. But the idea behind it is is that God has done something amazing here. 
And it's all through his influence. Okay, so you know the story, right? She's found favor. Here's what happens. Haman, who, who, who wants to kill all the Jews, who remembers this, Haman wants to kill all the Jews. And Esther's a secret Jew. So she gets everybody what? Praying and fasting. They're praying and fasting all over the kingdom. And they're praying and fasting. Her cousin Mordecai is despised by Haman. Haman builds a gallows because he wants to kill Mordecai because he just hates Mordecai. Okay, there's a whole lot of reasons for that. Mordecai won't bow to him and all the stuff that goes with that. But here's the deal. In the midst of all that, Haman builds a gallows, and what happens? Esther has a dinner, invites Haman to the dinner, invites the, Haman and the king to the dinner. They come, they have a great dinner. It's a great time. King says, what do you want, honey? I'll give you anything you want up to half the kingdom. She says, come back for dinner tomorrow. I'm thinking, okay, that's kind of interesting. They come back, and it's another time. Haman comes back again. He thinks he's being really privileged, but here's what happens. In the middle of all that, you know what happens, and this is kind of cool. Mordecai, a long time ago, saved the king, but the king didn't even know about it. And one night, in the middle of the night, God wakes the king up. He won't sleep. His mind won't shut off. So he called for the book of the Chronicles of the Kings. And when he reads the book of the Chronicles of the Kings, what's he find out? There's this God that saved my life. Oh, my goodness, he saved my life. Did we ever do anything for him? We didn't do anything for him. We got to do something for him. So he calls Haman and says, Haman, what should be done for the, for the man the king wants to show great favor upon? Because if the king wants to really bless somebody and show great favor upon him, what should you do with them? So Haman says, well, I think you ought to put him on a horse and put the king's robe on him and, and really parade him through town and make a big heyday about it because I think that's somebody really special. Why does he say that? Because he thinks he's talking about him. <laughs> I love favor. King turns around and says, okay, put Mordecai on a horse, and you lead him. Okay. <laughs> Yay, God. I love this stuff. It's in the book. It's really cool. So now Haman has to parade Mordecai through, saying this is the man that saved the king's life, and yay, blah. Okay, Because <laughs> he's, he's not very happy about all this. He's building the gallows because he wants to kill Mordecai. Y'all following this, right? In the middle of all that, God's got favor all over Esther. They have the second dinner, and here's what's going on. She begins to tell the king, this is what's really happening. You know the story. They're going to kill all the Jews. Haman's the one that's out to kill all the Jews. God turns the whole situation around. How many know on the same gallows that Haman builds for Mordecai, Haman is hung? Amen. It's a pretty amazing story. But what I want to tell you about is it's all about favor. I think it's kind of cool because God inserts his influence. Haman gets hanged, Mordecai gets exalted in the kingdom, and God shows favor. Shane mentions about Joseph. Look at the favor that's on Joseph's life. Go to Genesis 39. Let's look at it. Some powerful stuff here. But how many know when your brothers throw you in a pit, that doesn't sound like favor. <laughs> Come on. Then you get pulled out of the pit and you get thrown in prison. There's favor. Yeah, oh, hey, that's a whole lot better. <laughs> Might as well just die in the pit. Come on. And sometimes that's how we look at our life. But I think there's a place where no matter where you are, you understand, you know what? God's got his hand on me. I see his fingerprints all over me. And you walk out favor no matter what your circumstances. That's a pretty good thing. How many of you have heard the phrase, if life gives you lemons, what do you do? Make lemonade. It's a good day. I needed a drink anyway. Come on. You know what I'm talking about? Did you ever meet some people that are just totally optimistic? I like that. Then there's some people out there. How many know there's some people out there that would just complain even if you hung them with a brand new rope? They'd complain about the rope. <laughs> some people just complain about everything. I'm telling you, I wake up in the morning. I honestly, I do this, and I, do, I live this way. Most of you that know me know this, but I live this way. I live with the idea that favor is my inheritance. So I just figure this, it's a good day. If you call me, if you're talking to me, if you ask me how you're doing, I usually have one answer, incredibly awesome. It's an amazing day. I live in the realm of it's an amazing day. You know why? It's the day the Lord has made. Might as well be glad and rejoice in it. Come on, because why? Because he said so. There's a way where you can train yourself to live and walk in that. But you're going to understand something. You are favored of God. You say, but pastor, you don't know my life. I'm telling you something. There's favor all over you. And you just need to see that. 
And come on, it's, it's all about changing the lens you look at life through. It's all about changing your perspective. It's about actually being able to see that in your life. Because if I don't see it, I'm never looking for it. That's right. I'm telling you, I'm looking for places in my life where God inserts his influence and his favor. But because I'm looking for it, I see it all the time. I'm going to show you a couple of things. Go to Genesis 39. Let's turn there. Genesis 39, we'll look about verses 30. Let's go through. Let's go 20, 20 to 23. Okay? Genesis 39. Turn there with me and let's look. Because there's some pretty, pretty cool stuff, okay? Watch this. It starts out in verse 20 this way, okay? Genesis 39, verse 20. I would be better if I wasn't in Exodus. Sorry, I'm reading this thinking, this isn't what I want. Okay, <laughs> 39 and 20. Now we're there. Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. And he was there in the prison. But watch this. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hands all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hands because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. You mean God can bless you in prison? Absolutely. God can bless you anywhere if you let him. Here's the deal. If you find yourself in the prison like Joseph, watch this. You can do two things. You can either figure, okay, God, we're here. What are we going to do? Or you can go, I can't believe, God, that you let me here. I, can't, I thought you loved me. Why am I in prison? If you love me, why would you put me in this terrible place? All I ever tried to do was what was right. Come on. Because what did he do? What was right. All he did was what was right. Over and over, if I read it, it seems like Joseph carried himself with incredible integrity. Come on. Potiphar's wife is actually trying to seduce him, and he's running from her. And what's happened? He got in trouble. But here's something that's really interesting. If you study that and understand the culture of the day, anyone else would have been killed. Anyone else? Potiphar, uh, 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 Pharaoh, uh, yeah, Potiphar w would, have, would have believed his wife except for something. Joseph carried himself with such integrity that he had to look at his wife and Joseph and realize, i got to believe Joseph. Isn't that amazing? Because he did what was right. Remember that I said, always do the right thing? Always do the right thing. Always, always, always do the right thing. And expect the favor of God in your life. Joseph did the right thing. So now Potiphar, instead of believing his wife, is now believing Joseph. So now even though she has his coat, his cloak in her hand, and, and Joseph doesn't even defend himself, he doesn't have to. Just threw him in prison, did not have him executed. Anybody else would have been executed. You follow what I just said? Yeah. Seems like he's in prison. That is favor. Let's see, executed prison. I'm going for prison. <laughs> Let's see, if I get to pick, I pick prison and say, it's a good day. I still have my head on my shoulders. Do you understand? So now he's in prison and God's blessing him. Who's, you've read this story. Everybody in this room should have read this by now. But what's it say? And the Lord was with Joseph. Over and over and over it says the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. Why? Because he's got favor all over him. Even though it didn't look favorable. Come on, I'm separated from my family. I can't even see my dad. What's going on? And there's my brothers and they're the ones that threw me in the pit. What's going on? And they threw me in the pit because daddy gave me a coat and I don't even have my coat. I don't know if you ever studied this or not, but there's some amazing things about that coat. Because Joseph's daddy made him a coat, and that's true. But I want you to see this. His brothers took his coat. You know what happened when he got to Potiphar's house? Made him, ser made him servant in charge. Guess what he would wore? A special coat that would signify him as being the man in charge of the house. You know what happened? Potiphar's wife got his coat. Come on, his brothers took his first coat. Potiphar's wife took his second coat. They threw him back in another prison. And you know what happens in prison? Come on, you know what happens in prison? The Lord was with Joseph. So who's in the prison? The butler and the baker? Come on, he interprets their dreams. And what happens? Come on. The baker gets killed. The butler goes back up. The butler, the, the, the king's cupbearer. And now he's bringing his cup before the king. And the king's troubled with his dreams. And what happens? He interprets the dreams. Joseph comes out and interprets everything for the, for the Pharaoh. And what happens? Pharaoh makes him second in command. Guess what second in command wore? Special coat. Isn't that amazing? Why? Because when God puts a coat on you and the world tries to take it away, he'll give you a better coat. Oh, somebody, oh, I could preach right now. 
Come on. And if they take that one away, guess what God will give you? A better coat. <laughs> so, oh, some of you got to put, you're about ready to put on a better coat. You might have been through some seasons in your life, felt like you lost your coat. But I'm going to tell you something. You only lost it for a moment because God's got a better coat that he's going to put on you. I'm going to tell you something, my friend. There's a better coat that's waiting for you. Oh, I'll feel this right now. I read this stuff, and it, it just tells me, man, I'm going to tell you. You can sit around moaning and groaning and complaining and see everything that's wrong and amplify that, or you start confessing favor, declare it and confess it and call it in. I got the favor of God in my life. Do you understand that? I profess that all the time. I walk in favor. I think you've got to profess it. I, th I think you can call it in. Why? Because death and life are in the power of your tongue. I believe that with everything in my heart. Come on, man. Go to Exodus chapter 3. Let me show you something there. <laughs> we, there's a place where we just call that in. I'm telling you, we just walk this thing out. Go to Exodus chapter 3 because you've got the Israelites. They're slaves for 400 years in Egypt. Doesn't sound like favor, does it? But look at verses 19 through 22 because I love it. Exodus chapter 3, verse 19. And I am sure the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not by a mighty hand. I'll stretch out my hand. I'll smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I'll do in the midst thereof. And after that, he'll let you go. And I'll give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it'll come to pass that when you go, you're not going empty. Woohoo! Some of you need to declare, I'm not going empty. Some of you might need to just declare, I am. You can declare it with your own lips. You can make a declaration. I'm not going empty. Why? Because I got the favor of God in my life. Because I am a man that walks in favor. Because I'm a woman that's favored of God. Because I'm not going empty. How many know? When they went out, I read it in Psalms 105 earlier when we were talking about communion. And they brought the silver and the gold, and the Lord brought them out with a high hand. Yeah, amen. You might as well purpose, I'm going to walk with a high hand. What's that mean, a high hand? I think they were high fiving. I don't know. <laughs> we got the silver. Oh, we got the gold. Yeah. Come on. They, they had it. it was, they were the blessed of God. When they came, come on, he said, I'm going to get you out of here. I'm going to bring you out with favor. The Egyptians are going to look upon you with favor. Do you, do you, does anybody get baffled by this idea that we're going to let our slaves go, but first let's give them a bunch of gold and silver? <laughs> come on. Come on. Here, slave, here's some gold. Here, slave, here's some silver. They gave them all kinds. They were loaded down with so much silver and gold. That's amazing to me. Like, I don't, I don't know if that messes your head. I, I think about That's God. It's favor. Favor isn't fair. Seems to me like they got a whole lot more than they lost. I love this stuff. I read this, and it speaks volumes to me. See, I, I got favor. You ever read the Deuteronomy 28 blessings? Yeah. I, I, go to Deuteronomy 28. I, 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 I didn't plan any of this, but it's happening, so let's just go there. Go to Deuteronomy 28. I love this stuff. But in Deuteronomy 28, there's something that I think is a, there's an amazing phrase in Deuteronomy 28. I, I love it. So, so let's look, okay? I love this. I love, this is cool. It'll come to pass if you hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord your God to observe and do all his commandments, which I command you this day, the Lord your God will set you on high above all the nations on the earth. Sound like favor? Sounds like favor. And all these blessings will come on you and overtake you if you hearken to the voice of the Lord your God. You'll be blessed in the city and blessed in the field. You'll be blessed in the fruit of your body, blessed in the fruit of the ground, in the fruit of your cattle, in the increase of your kind, the flocks of your sheep. You'll be blessed in your basket and blessed in your store. Blessed will you be when you come in and blessed when you go out. You'll be blessed when you're blessed to your enemies that rise up against you. They'll be smitten before your face. They'll come out against you one way. They'll flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing upon you in the storehouses. And in all that you set your hand to, he'll bless you in the land which the Lord your God gives you. He'll establish you a holy people unto himself. Come on. You know when I see this? I, 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 I love some of the phraseology that's in here because what he says is the Lord's going to command the blessing to come on you. I love this idea of command. And then it says, watch it. The blessing of the Lord will what? Overtake you. Do you understand what that means to overtake something? It's like you're trying to run from it and you can't. 
<laughs> it's like, I'm too blessed. I can't take you anymore. No, no. And they're still coming. They're chasing you. And you're trying, no, I can't take these blessings anymore. It's like you're trying to run away from it. You can't even run away from the blessings of God because they're so plentiful. God's saying, I want to bless you with that kind of favor in your life. There's a place where you have favor. There's a place where you have blessing. And I read this stuff, and it says, come on, man, we got favor. Going out and rising up in the city, in the field, in the country, wherever you're going, the blessing of the Lord rests upon his people. It's the blessings that are going to overtake you. It's like you can't even get away from it. How do I get that kind of blessing? Galatians 6 and 7 says, be not deceived. God's not mocked. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. You know what I think? I think if I sow blessing, guess what's going to happen? I'm going to reap blessing. There's a place where I'm just blessed, and I understand what it looks like to be blessed. God wants to bless his people. So I read that kind of stuff. Luke 6 and 38, you know what it says? Given it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will men bring into your bosom. He didn't even say God would bring it. He said men would bring it. Do you understand that? We read that, and we think, oh, God's going to bless me. He said, I'm going to move on men. I'm going to give you such favor that men will be attracted. They'll want to bless you. That's amazing to me. I need a microphone. Go ahead. I was actually going to ask you this question today um, during the break, but I didn't get a chance. Um, I don't know the surrounding context of Deuteronomy 28. Right. But when he's talking about the commandments, I guess I'm trying to think in the mindset um, of Old Covenant, New Covenant, and right. being careful with you know, where I get things from and all that kind of stuff. So how does this, how do the blessings of the old covenant fit in with who I am in the new covenant? And how, how come I can take those as mine now? Because I want to, this is awesome, but I'm, I'm ha- I have a stumbling block in my mind saying, how? Do I you love know what it. I mean? Sure, I understand exactly what you're saying. And, and I'll, I'll give you this. There's two thoughts that are running through my mind. Turn to Galatians 3. And while you're turning to Galatians 3, um, uh, let me explain this to you. Um, we're not under the law. The Ten Commandments are under the law. But Jesus, when they said to him, what's the first and great commandment? What did he say? The first and great commandment is like unto this. What did he say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like unto it, that you would love your neighbor as yourself. Now, those are amazing things, but watch what he says immediately following that statement. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. What did he just say? He took everything from the old dispensation, brought it down. The, 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 can I say this? All those old commandments, and, and can I say this? The 365 or 367, I think it's 367 points of the law. He takes all that and brings it down to two commandments. Love God and love your neighbor. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. That's what he just said. Okay? So now I've got the Deuteronomy 28 blessings that I'm reading here, and I'm thinking, wow, these blessings are pretty cool. I want these blessings in my life. How do they become in my life? Galatians 3, verse 20. Do you everybody see it? And if you're Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What was the promise? All the covenants that God made with Abraham are mine. Okay, when I read these Deuteronomy 28 blessings, the blessings that I read in Deuteronomy 28 are promises that God made to the covenant people of Abraham. Everybody okay with that? He's speaking to the Jewish nation here. And what he's saying is, this is Abraham's covenant promise right here. And if I read this, it said, when I came into Christ, I became heirs according to the promise. I'm Abraham's seed, and this was promised to Abraham's seed. Every the covenant was promised to the seed of Abraham. That means I can claim it for me. I love to claim the promises of God. See, here's what I believe. I believe you can take a promise and stand on it. Not just because of the promise, but because of the nature of the promiser. God's nature is that he keeps his promise. So there's a place where we receive that, and there's a grace on that. So I just think this, when, and it's a, it's a great question because it says, this was an old covenant promise. Does it apply to me today? According to Galatians 3 and 20, I would say, yeah, it does. There's a promise for that. So I've stood on that and just believe that no matter where I go, the blessing of the Lord is going to rest upon me. I honestly believe that we can live in such a life of blessing that we can actually believe for our own self. I'm going to wake up today a blessed man. I'm going to walk today in the blessing and the favor of God. When I lay my head on the pillow at night, the blessing of God's there. But here's the deal. i got to keep my heart pure and my conscience clear. And that speaks volumes to me. God's favor, the insertion of his holy influence is in my life. And I think about all these things, okay? Now, here's the deal. How does this affect me when I'm walking through the valley? 
How does this affect me? Come on, because I can claim all the blessing and all the favor I want to, but what, what do you do when the challenge is in your face? Y'all following what I'm saying? Okay? Because uh, I've talked a lot about this. Can I, I can praise God and praise him like crazy because the bill's due the end of the month, but I'm just going to believe God that he's going, the, the finances are going to come in to pay that bill. Who's been there? And, then, and then, then you're praising God and right up to the midnight hour, and boy, I'm telling you, at 1150, the money shows up. Woohoo! Praise God. Hallelujah. He's good. What do you do at 1230 when the money didn't show up and the electric got shut off? You know what I mean? You're still going to have to praise him. You're still going to have to give him praise. There's a place where we so walk it out. But what happens to this? And you start thinking about being blessed and walking in the blessing. But the truth of the matter is, is walking in the blessing is more than just, and, and I want to say this, there's a place where I walk in this truth. There's a place where I walk in this and it becomes a reality in my life. That no matter what's going on around me, it doesn't change my view because God's still good. Some, nothing changed. Nothing really happened. Nothing really circumvented my faith. It's getting ready to pour down rain. If you happen to have your windows open, you might want to get that. There's thunder rumbling. That's what's going on. Okay? Now watch this. Here's what I want to tell you. I preached yesterday. Uh, and, and I really preached yesterday. <laughs> I got real Pentecostal yesterday. It was a Pentecostal experience in the house. But I was preaching yesterday on the idea that the devil will do anything he can to circumvent your faith. Amen. He's a liar. Yes, he and he's the father of it. And, and as we were looking through those scriptures and just different things, over and over and over, this is what I want to talk to you about is you, there's a place where we're so established in who we are that no matter what's going on around us, it doesn't change our identity. It doesn't change this. Remember that I said you can go to a class week after week, month after month. You can get all the training and all the teaching you want to. But if it's not established in your heart, there's a challenge that comes up. And when that challenge comes up, this is where the, can I say this is where the rubber meets the road? Where you, where you really determine and purpose in your heart, am I going to walk this thing out or not? Am I going to be real about this thing or not? Because and, 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 I'm telling you, the devil's going to lie to you. He's going to get in your ear. He's going to tell you all kinds of things that, that aren't right. He's going to twist Scripture. He'll do everything he can just to mess with your head. But you've got a purpose in your heart. I'm going to walk this thing out. It's got to be real to you. And I'm going to make you a promise. If it's real in your head but it's not real in your heart, you'll stumble and fall. And you'll have to purpose because of your head knowledge to get back up until it gets into your heart. It's when you get it in your heart that it makes all the difference in the world. This, you cannot serve God with your head. I'm going to say that. That was worth saying right there. You can't serve God with your head. This has got to be a matter of the heart. This is a heart thing. And you've got a purpose in your own heart, man. How do I walk this thing out? What, what happens to me? Because I'm, I'm going to talk about this, but there's a place where we walk in favor. And I understand favor. I understand favor real well. But here's the deal. If I want the favor of God, I'm going to have to walk this thing out all the time. Jesus grew in what? Wisdom and stature, favor with God and favor with man. Why'd that happen? Because he walked this thing out. Do you understand you can't live a haphazard life and expect to have the favor of God every time you turn around? You can't have the favor of God in your life and, and you're walking on some kind of a up and down and back and forth and in and out and sideways and here and there. That's never going to happen in our lives. You're not going to walk into faith. See, we see people with favor, and we see God doing amazing things, and we think, oh, I want that in my life. There's a price you pay for that. There's a, I don't even know if it's right to say it's a price you pay, but there's a discipline in your life, and there's a walk there that's so established in the order of God, it's so established in your life that you're not challenged by every wind that comes along. I hope I'm making sense. But there's a place where you say, man, I'm going to walk this thing, and it's real. And it's not going to shift and change. There's some things in my life. Can I say this? There's some things in my life I don't understand. I wish some things. There, I, I want that do-over that Irene was talking about, you know, <laughs> you know, b b the, in a couple of places in my life. I, I wish my life was different financially. And I w there's some other things I look at in my life I wish were different, but they're not. But here's the deal. I can either stumble over what I don't have or I can celebrate what I do have. So I make the conscious choice to celebrate what I do have. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. You, can, you can moan and groan and complain and wish and whatever and focus on all the junk, or you can celebrate what you got and who you are and what Jesus is doing in your life. Yeah. 
See, I might not be where I want to be, but I'm not where I used to be, and I'm going to celebrate the fact that I've come from there to here, and I'm going in that direction. And we, so we learn to celebrate life. We learn to, we learn to enjoy what God's doing. There's a place where we purpose in our heart, man, this thing's awesome. Let's walk it out. It's fun. It ought to be fun. I'm telling you, for me, this concept of serving God is a joy, not a chore. I'm walking with him. I understand I'm not a servant. I'm a son. I understand that. But there's a place where I'm enjoying my sonship. The old songwriter said, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I am. I understand that reality. So here's the deal, and this is what's in my heart right now. I'm ready for the favor of God to be released in my life in a greater way. And I've been praying about that. I trust that you pray about that. God, I want your favor. I want to, if Jesus increased in favor, then even though I understand I have favor, there must be an increase for that. Does that make sense? There's a place where we understand that makes sense to us. And we say, God, I want an increase of your favor in my life. I want an increase of your favor in my finances. I want an increase of your favor in my relationships. I want an increase of your favor in my home. Whatever it might be, but your purpose in that in your heart. Go with me to Psalm 30, and I'm going to close with this. We're not going to stay long. But I want you to go to Psalm 30. It's two verses. It's verses 4 and 5. And it speaks about favor one more time. And I want to show you this because there's a place for that. Yeah, Psalm 30. I'll show you this because this is a verse that's been burned in my heart and it's, it's kept me through some tough places, okay? We're looking at verses 4 and 5. Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of His, and give thanks at the remembrance of His holiness. For His anger endures for a moment, in His favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy. Oh, come on. Joy comes in the morning. I'm going to tell you something. There's favor. In the midst of favor, there might be a dark night. But I'm going to tell you, even in a dark night, there's joy coming in the morning. Weeping might endure for a night. But joy comes in the morning. There's a place where even in the midst of this, watch this, because even in the midst of a dark night, I'm still going to sing. I said, even in the midst of a tough place, I'm still going to lift up my voice and praise him. Even in the midst when it's in my face, I'm still going to give thanks because God is good. Even on a, on, on a day where, where things seem to be falling apart all over, I'm still going to say this is the day that the Lord has made and I choose to rejoice and be glad in it. See, I think choosing to rejoice is a big phrase. I, I, I think I choose what I'm going to look at my day like. I think it's my choice. If I call Pastor Rick, I say, how you doing today, buddy? You know what he always says to me? I'm having a great day. You know why? And I know what he's going to say because it's my choice. I choose to have a great day. I choose to look at it from that perspective. I choose to walk in favor. I choose to look for the favor of God. It's my choice. I have predetermined in my heart. I'm going to enjoy this day because I get to choose that. It's up to you what you focus on. Do you understand what I just said? Yeah. My wife has a phrase that's real. It's all about choices. It's all about choices. You know what? It really is. It's all about choices. You can choose how you want to live. You can choose what you want to do. You can choose. There's a whole lot of choices. I understand there's some things that happen in our life that we don't get to make a choice. I understand that. But a whole lot of the choices that we make determine what we have. We have blamed the devil for a lot of stuff. That wasn't even him. It was just our choice. Thank God for his grace. Thank God for his mercy. But I'm going to tell you something, man. I want, I want to put your mind on favor for just a minute. I'll talk to you real plain. Some of you know nothing at all about history for my life, but... At 10 years old, my dad ran off with his secretary. My mother was pregnant, about six months pregnant, with my little brother Doug when dad left home. So we were very challenged. We were poor, and we knew it. But it was okay. We were happy. We were so poor, we spelled it P-O-R because we couldn't afford two O's. That's poor. <laughs> in the process of that, now I'll just say this, and we, we, we grew up in a 
pretty rough area and whatever. I won't get into all that. But what I'm going to tell you is this. In the process of all that stuff, um, I made some bad choices. And I understood that. But I just felt like that's what life was handing me. I want to tell you something. You don't have to live with what life hands you. I said you don't have to live with what life hands you. You get to make choices. At 18 years old, I gave my heart to Christ. Best choice I ever made in my life. And I've never looked back. And I can tell you that. I've never looked back. I purposed on my heart in that day. I'm going 100% for God. And it's been full speed ahead for me. And I love that. But I want to talk to you a little more about some other things that have come along. In the midst of that, I had to make a choice. Because we were told that from the neighborhood I grew up in and from the lifestyle I had, you could never make anything out of your life. Now, I could have chose to listen to that, but I chose not to. And I purposed that if, if Jesus came into my life, I could do anything because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It says one of the first scriptures I memorized, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I'm pretty convinced then I can do all things means actually all things. So, so whatever, whatever I put my hands to, I just got to believe he's going to put his hands with them. Does that make sense? You know why I believe that? Because it's my choice to believe that. I choose to believe whatever I put my hands to, he'll put his hands with me. That's my choice. So I take that choice and I run with that choice. And here's where I'm at. And this is what gets really, really big in my heart for you right now. There's a place where I actually believe in this thing about favor. I believe that you can live a favored life. I believe that God will have his hands upon you. I believe that God's going to keep you. I believe that God's going to prosper you. I believe that God's going to help you when you need his help. I believe that God will show up if you ask him. I believe that if you invite him into your situation, he's anxious to come. He he so, wants to, and so, he so wants to be such a big part of your life, he's dying to get there. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? There's, there's this amazing truth about God. And, and the fact is, is that he wants to be part of every part of your life. He wants to insert his holy influence in every area of your life. There's a place where you choose to accept his favor. Because when Jesus stood up in the temple for to read, he said, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the year of the Lord's favor. We're in that year. Do you understand? That year wasn't 365 days. It was an age of grace. We're in that age. That's what he was referring to. It's grace dispensation. It's the change of covenants. It's the favor of God. It's the time of God's favor. You get to see. You, can I say this? It really is up to you, but you've got to focus on that. I walk in favor with God. I'm favored by the Most High. I love that phrase. Do you understand how powerful that is? When you look in the mirror, you're looking at somebody that has God's favor in their life. That's an amazing truth. That's your identity. Do you understand? This is all about identity. I want you to understand this. If you don't get anything else from the last couple of days that I've been teaching, catch this, because this is huge to me. It's always about identity. I've said that a couple of times. I'll keep saying that. But I have found that no matter what's going on in your life, when we get our identity right, the rest of this stuff falls in line. We start to understand who we really are. Identity is major. Your identity is that you're favored. You're a favored son. You're, come on, that's amazing to me. Wow. And it's the reality of being this. What if I'm going through weeping? It endures for a night. Joy's coming in the morning. Come on, just because you're a child of God doesn't mean that you're not going to have some time where there's pain and emotions and all the other things that take over. And I understand all that. But the fact of the matter is, my perspective is, joy's coming in the morning. I'm favored. God's favor rests upon me. His fingerprints are all over my life. I know that. I live that. I walk that. I'm telling you. Over and over and over, I see it. The favor of God rests upon those that are His. You just got to be looking for it. Now, you can either stumble over what you don't have or celebrate what you do have, and you get to choose. Everybody okay with what I'm saying? Catch that. That's huge, man. That was worth coming today for right there. I want you to understand, you're a favored. You're a favored child of the Most High God. He loves you with an everlasting love. You got it? Bow your heads with me. Just close your eyes for just a minute. It's a big deal, man. Come on. Sing unto the Lord, O you saints of His, and give thanks at the remembrance of His holiness. Sing unto the Lord. You see, you might be going through a tough situation, but then you've got to look up and say, I'm going to sing again. 
I'm going to sing again. I might have been in a tough place. I might have been, oh, come on, I might have been between a rock and a hard place, but I'm going to sing again. I might, have, I'm, I might have rocks on one side, mountain on another, and a red sea in front of me, but I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to sing again. Pharaoh's army might be pounding its hoof bridge behind me, but I'm going to tell you, I'm going to sing again, and all of a sudden the Red Sea just parts. I'm walking through on dry ground. What are you talking about, Pastor? Weeping might endure for a night, but joy's coming in the morning. I'm going to tell you something. I've got favor. The favor of God is upon my life. I decree favor upon my life. There's something to think about with that. I want you to think about that right now. As we just decree favor, I want you to think about receiving the favor of God upon your life. Uh, you may be working in a store. You may have just got to that store. You may have been on there two weeks, and a job is opening up. Guess what? God could put his favor upon you. And all of a sudden, you started out as the clerk, and pretty soon, you're the manager. Somebody else been there 17 years, but you know what? They didn't have the favor of God. You got the favor of God. Believe me, I'm telling you, you can do anything. Do I know that? Absolutely. I stand before you a product of somebody who understands what the favor of God is about on their life. I'm telling you, you need to understand what the favor of God looks like upon your life. I'm about to decree favor. I believe there's a release of favor. I, I just feel that rising up in my heart like I should make a decree of favor over this house right now because God wants to release his holy influence in your life. Uh, I am convinced right now. Wow, I just feel this. I'm going to do it. Just, just keep your head. Man, just get ready. God, I just feel this. Father, I thank you right now. Lord, we decree favor in the house. Uh, we decree favor even for those that are by the internet. God, I thank you for a release of your favor, your holy influence uh, just coming upon us as sons and daughters. Uh, God, I decree favor. Let there be a release of favor right now. Let the favor of God rest upon the people of God. God, I decree the favor of God is being released in our life. And Father, we are recipients of divine favor, your holy influence being released into our life. We decree favor, the favor of God. Lord, there might be some that have had weeping, but that night's about to end and joy is coming in the morning. Uh, God, I decree it and declare it right now. Let it be established, oh God, on the earth. Uh, I thank you for a release of your favor upon your children. I decree favor, a release of the power of God, a release of the favor of God, a release of the anointing of God, a release of favor upon your kids. Uh, God, I thank you. We decree the favor of God, and we thank you, God. We receive your influence upon our life, uh, that even as Jesus grew in wisdom and stature, he grew in favor with God. He grew in favor with man. We decree today a release of favor that causes us to grow in favor with God and in favor with man. I thank you, God, for favor being released that even by the end of this week, reports will be coming in of how I got here and God blessed me there and I went here and God blessed me there and I went this way and God blessed me that way and it was nothing but a divine release of favor upon your children. God, we decree favor and the blessing of God and the release of it. And in the process, we commit ourselves to live holy and walk holy before the Lord our God. Because even as Jesus walked, we're called to walk. And that's where the favor's released. Uh, so, Father, even as we walk out truth, understanding our identity, we thank you for the favor of God impacting not only our lives, but the lives of all those around us. God, I thank you. When you rain on me, everybody around me is getting wet. So, God, we declare it right now. Not only are we going to get rained on, but, God, our family's getting wet, and our friends are getting wet, our house is getting wet, our neighborhood's getting wet. God, because the rain of your favor's coming upon your kids. God, we decree it, and we declare it. Let the rain of your favor fall upon us. God, we receive it right now. I thank you, God, for favor. Let it be released in a major way, the testimonies would even be in before the end of the week. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we declare it. In Jesus' name we receive it. In Jesus' name. Because it's purchased through your blood. God, thank you. Thank you, God. And the church said, Amen. 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 Bless God. Bless God. Bless God. Thank the Lord. Cool. We're good. Anybody? Anything? We good? Amen, you're dismissed. <laughs> Bless God.